Well, hello, good people of the world. We find ourselves here again on a Monday. You know how this goes. First, we talk about the brand that allows me to make this podcast. Then we talk about the guests. So let's dive in. Today's episode is brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. Let me tell you this. There are some cool things on the horizon with that brand. We're heading to Normandy to jump in on the 80th anniversary. We just went through our refresher training. There's going to be some pretty cool content coming from that. So stand by. But before then, let's talk about their business. We're going to go right now to their website. Fool's Gold, Irish cream flavored coffee. Who doesn't like a bag of coffee with a leprechaun wearing pano night vision goggles? I do. I don't know if I like Irish cream flavored coffee, though. I don't know. So apparently St. Patrick's Day is around the corner because I can't imagine this being the product they're going to sell for Easter or Christmas. So if you're into it, you can go now to blackriflecoffee.com and get some of that as we work our way down. For those of you new to the website, there's a slider here, light roast to dark roast. You can also click on any of the coffees and it'll tell you everything you want to know, where it's from, tasting notes, and I think even suggestions on how to make it. Apparel and gear, very straightforward. Coffee bundles and coffee samplers, also straightforward. As you continue down, they have their best sellers. And then, of course, the social media. And you can join their email list if you want to. They make this podcast possible. I like Black Rifle, not for the coffee, even though I do enjoy their coffee and I own or I'm a partial owner in a Black Rifle coffee store. I like it because of the people who founded the brand and what they stand for and their dedication to giving back to veteran causes. So support them at BlackRifleCoffee.com. My guest today, you had a friend who you've known forever and never probably have been traditionally or like structured in an introduction by somebody else, but you come into the same circles and you see each other and you're like, oh, hey, what's going on? And you always find time to uh, connect. You can't figure out how long it's been and why. Yeah, that's my guest today. It's Bert Soren. I've known Bert for a long time, and it, I'm amazed it took me this long to actually get him up here on the podcast. Um, he's an incredible athlete. <sighs> Unfortunately, I'd probably still say currently in comparison to myself. Which there's some uh, pre-adolescent children that are great athletes in comparison to myself, which is a dig on me and not necessarily on Bert. Um, but just think All-American track and field. He did the hammer and the 35-pound weight throw. Um, I think he might have played around in the Highland Games a little bit. He was an Olympic trials athlete. All of those things are amazing. Um, I knew him through the lens of the equipment he produces. So he's the CEO of Sornex Equipment. Strength and conditioning equipment, barbells, dumbbells, the whole nine. The story behind that business, him and his father, the relationship, how close they took it to the brink, lessons in entrepreneur, entrepreneurialism, entrepreneurship, I don't know, whichever one of those is correct. Uh, that's what I loved about this conversation. The physical feats, of course, something to regard for sure. The businesses, the lessons, the insight – that stuff to me is fascinating. So how about I shut up and we get into the conversation? Episode 326 with Bert Soren. Enjoy. Okay, got the red smoke. Turn run, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, what a minute, give it to me, I need it. Get cleared hot. Can't be cleared hot. Did you know what I was trying to figure out today? Knowing that you were come up, is I can't remember when and where we met. I think the first time we met in person, was, and we were actually on a podcast together at John Wellborn's at uh, one of the original. Um, like L.A.? No, uh, when he moved to Austin. Okay. And he did. Power Athlete Symposium? Power Athlete Symposium 1, maybe. It was like one of the first ones. I've spoken at his events a few times. I swear I've done one in Orange County. I don't know if it was – it had to have been a power athlete. Maybe CrossFit football? Yeah, I ne I, I've never been to CrossFit football. John and I knew each other from the old CrossFit days, yeah. but I didn't – we didn't hang out really until he – like a lot until he was in uh, Austin. Well, you don't live in Austin, so why were you guys hanging out a lot down there? Well, when he'd invite me down for stuff, or I'd come down for some event, or I'd go by a swing by his place. We did his gym down there, too. He's a very smart man. He is. He's terrifying because he's very, very smart, and he's large. Yeah. 
So you put those two things together. You would look at him and think that he is a brute given his size, mm -hmm. which he is a brute. Truth. He uh, unfortunately started doing jujitsu as well. Ooh. Just got his blue belt, I think. Oh, I'm sorry, Jonathan, if I'm speaking out of school, but I swear he just got his blue belt. His uh, coach, and I might be murdering this a little bit, but uh, Zanje Hibero, or Zan, yeah, Zanji. I've heard it pronounced a few different ways. Um, one of the best that's ever done it. Ah, perfect. Easiest way to say that. So that's who he's learning perfect. from. Perfect. So we got, Fortunately, like... he's not an athlete. You know, he doesn't have an <laughs> athletic background. <laughs> right. Right. He's not a pro bowler. Yeah. He's a monster. With really quick and strong hands. Yeah. Ah, dang it. So we, my wife and I went down and visited the gym, and uh, <clears throat> he's like, hey, man, you want to roll? And in my mind, no, I was thinking... No part of that. No. Nope. Fortunately, sure don't. I'm far enough ahead of him from a knowledge perspective, and that's the only thing that that's saved it. me. Jeez, no, I wouldn't want any part of that. Yeah. Wasn't it? Was it Jocko that broke Dudley's neck? I was. The, I was physically there for that. How was that? <sighs> I mean, anytime your buddy I'm gonna gets turn his neck Jocko's broke. own words on him. Okay, because I think. Not positive, Michael, you can Google this, that there's a book called Extreme Ownership <laughs> that may be co-authored by one Jocko Willink. Now, Dudley did make it worse for himself. I, I, okay. When it happened, I didn't. I had been doing jiu-jitsu for maybe six months. Okay. So I didn't understand exactly what happened. Now I do because it's a spicy submission that I use on Michael from time mm -hmm, to time. It's a mm -hmm. hammer fist choke. Enjoy that. Which is literally taking for uh, for people watching. It's you make a fist and you put it directly on top of the Adam's apple. And there are a variety of ways that you can increase pressure. You can put your sternum on top of that and drive it in. Mm -hmm. So more than just like <clears throat> bicepping it in. Or, yes. Or probably Yeah. Um other. you yeah. could I mean Oh, so you're more this Wait. It's like down. Got yeah, it. you have one oh, hand, so and you probably like... want to have your other hand out so in case they start bucking you around a little bit. Okay. Um, Jocko's not tiny. Mm, no. This all started. He's part gorilla for sure. This all started with Dudley, who I know is a mutual friend, one of my favorite people on earth, like the most gentle yep. giant ever. <laughs> he said. So we were we did a weekend where we taught Dudley how to skydive, which <laughs> is like an ent. Testing gravity, <laughs> just eight feet. I mean, and I'm talking vertical wingspan, not lateral. Sure. So we were in San Diego. We did skydiving. Before that, though, we did some wind tunnel time. And uh, and Jocko shut up. Yeah, Jocko shut up in the tunnel. How so that? had Jocko. I, I Jocko. Yeah, I would, yeah. I would assume he didn't come so. to jump though. He just came to do the tunnel. Yep. And so we did skydiving, and then I think, yeah, he did some archery with Jocko. So it was like it was mm -hmm. uh, like the. GBRS guys, their knowledge yeah. exchange or yeah. transfer. I think they just so, like a like a potluck of, yeah, of we skills. Picked a day. Well, yeah. the skydiving took a weekend, but there was archery, and then we went to Victory MMA, mm -hmm. and we did a little bit of training. It was it, Jocko did a really good job of like an intro session, and at the end, Dudley says, "I want to get some content." Famous. <laughs> 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 of course he did. I want to get some content, and. So, you know, can we move around a little bit? And Jocko sits down or was sitting and he said, okay, just attack me. <laughs> Perfect. And Dudley looked at him and said, what do you mean? He's like, just start. What was missing in this, in the intro that Jocko taught, which was very good. I think he probably <laughs> taught uh, basically a trap and roll. Somebody's on top of you, how to get them, you know, to s reverse the position. Very simple. He didn't really talk about how to tap or ah. when you should tap or why. Mm. And for many years, Jocko has used as an excuse, which is nowhere in the Extreme Ownership book. Maybe it's in the version two. He said, well, I'm sure he's watched the UFC, which is not the same thing as understanding. Which is where my <laughs> mind initially went. I was like, everyone's seen guys tap, but. It's different when somebody's applying pressure. So right. Dudley ended up getting swept and mounted which should be absolutely no surprise Jocko is a savage black belt who is current consistent and yes. has been doing it for decades yes so Dudley ended up on his back Jocko had mounted him and Dudley didn't know how to escape and probably didn't recognize the submission because it had never happened so what he ended up doing was locking his arms behind Jocko's back and squeezing 
So whatever pressure Jaka was putting on him as well, Dudley pulled him into him, which mm-hmm. doubled it. And uh, yeah, J- then Dudley thought he had throat cancer. Well, was there like a was <laughs> no. there like a thing? Or... No, there was like a. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know if he ever actually verbalized <laughs> tapped or did tap, or if Jocko just in sheer terror, feeling that he might accordion his windpipe, let right. go. Right. It ended at some point, and there was. <clears throat> <clears throat> but if you go back to the any of Dudley's social media or podcasts within about a year of that, constantly he's like, <clears throat> <clears throat> "That's hilarious." I think it was the hyoid bone. Yeah. Michael, yeah, and uh, he did a shirt like Jocko gave me throat cancer. He thought he did, he, and he, of course he didn't <laughs> tell Jocko. And he's getting like tubes shoved down his nose and his throat to try to see if he has cancer. And it, uh, yeah, I mean, That's you know, a- if you're gonna if you're gonna show stuff to people, explain to them. You know, if it's like a mm-hmm. consequent based activity, <laughs> explain to them the out. You know, mistakes yeah, were made. The, what's the safe word? Mistakes I mean, were made. I, I never heard snorkel. Pineapple, obviously, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, yeah. Mistakes were made. <laughs> Years later, they laughed about it, but uh, it took a while, but they got there. <laughs> they, even, they eventually worked it. Yeah, we were at elk camp and they're like, yeah, Jocko broke my neck. I was like, this is a great story. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah, I was sitting there watching this happen. I don't think I said it, but in my head, I was thinking... I don't know if this is a good idea. And I'll be honest with you, I don't say that about many things. <laughs> you're, you're... I'm down for generally whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Until the safe word. Yeah, Until I just... Until the safe word. You know, Dudley is an expert at archery. Right. You know, and so he had kind of gone from everybody's wheelhouse, and then they would jump into somebody else's pool. Sure. And not that Dudley in any way, shape, or form was trying to challenge Jocko. But if a phone comes out and they're like, hey, let's just train a bit, you're not going to get the dude who's at the top of the pyramid to play as if he's at the base of it stacking boulders. Right. You're going to get what you get. (laughs) Yes. Perfect way to put it. Yes. Yeah. You're – the horses are going to run. Oh, man. Horses are going to run. Yeah, I was at Jocko's a few years ago when we did his gym, and we obviously know where he lives, but yeah. the ocean's out there, and yeah. and so like you're the same age as me, so well maybe you don't have the semi irrational fear of sharks, maybe you do. I think everybody does. I was just forced into an environment where they that were... you just kind of had to go with it, right? Yeah, you know, I never saw one in my uh, SEAL career. The only time I ever saw a shark was up in Santa Cruz when oh. I was growing up. Oh, okay, from a distance. Yeah, so I was the only child, so. You know, I had HBO, so I watched, you know, Jaws 1, 2, and 3 every day of the summer by myself. And then so I was just totally convinced that every body of water had a giant great white shark in it. Why, those, why did you pick that genre for your by yourself? Uh, I mean, the A-team was out during that time. Well, it, but, dun, but dun, dun, <laughs> true. Dun, 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 dun. Michael, well, have you ever even heard of the A-team? No. Re- well, Red Dawn and... Are you serious? I'm looking it up right now. Oh, no. Red Dawn he... and Uncommon Valor were also on a lot of times during then, which was perfect. Yeah. But Jaws, I just like cool big animals. So I would, yeah. there was this, I'm really excited about it, but I'm also pretty sure that I'm going to get blasted by a great white every time I go in the water. So that I realize this is an irrational fear. So anyway. But until, surf, like, until you get bit. Until you're like, and then it's a, completely <laughs> rational. Completely <laughs> rational. <laughs> and damn you. Yeah. So I was I was at Jocko's and we were talking about surfing. He's like, we're at Josh Hall. And he's like, you need to come surf. And I was like, you got, you know, just a question, a safety brief. Yeah. So what's the story with the big sharks out here? No, nah, no, nah, we don't really have them out here. Really? No, nah, no, nah, they're further out. I'm like, well, okay. You, well, totally. You'll be fine. Totally. I'm like, oh, okay. Good stuff. I, I would still. I'm pretty sure that's technically described as a lie. Yeah. Oh, it's a big lie. <laughs> big lie. <laughs> big lie. So, so I'm like, you know, I kind of felt it was a lie, but I went with just like trying to get my, I was like, yeah, the, the chances of me getting whacked by a shark are pretty low. Yeah. Let's go out. I'm, I'm getting over the, the, you know, the whatever. Literally, he tells me that whatever day it was. The next day I fly home to South Carolina. I walk in the house and my family is watching TV. And it was a show called When Sharks Attack. There's a, it, the, they were in a boat and they were out in the ocean. And they were videoing, obviously, yeah. by the coast. And they were shooting back towards the shore. And I could see Jocko's house. Where the show says where sharks attack. And I look, I'm like, I know those cliffs. 
I'm like, holy shit, I call him like, you bastard. <laughs> he goes, oh, yeah, I totally knew they're, they're, they're all over the place. He did. I can appreciate that. Yeah, which I appreciate it, but uh, so I haven't gone yet. I so. think even though there's been no – that I'm aware of, there have been no recorded cases of orcas actually eating humans. Mm. Have you heard about them attacking boats? Yes, recently, right? I mean – Yikes. Maybe they're a little smarter than we thought. <laughs> maybe they're AI. <laughs> Like we were talking about before. <sighs> I mean, come on. Now, let's not get crazy. <laughs> now we're going to have to fight. They're organic. We're going to have to fight orcas too? They're savage. Yeah. Yeah, they, they yeah. Uh, I mean, well, I should, I should rephrase that. There are no known recorded instances of an orca attacking a human in the wild. Blackfish, a movie that I recommend everybody watch mm -hmm. if they want to support things like SeaWorld, where they have orcas in mm -hmm. tanks, will change your mind. As to the savage nature of these animals. And maybe as humans, we should stop thinking that we know what is best for nature. That's probably a pretty good guess all, all the way around. I'm talking about – have you seen that movie? I have not. It's worth it. I'm, but I'm talking about an orca – A little bit different path than like Free Willy. Yeah, but I mean gingerly biting a trainer's toe and then pulling him underwater until the point where – He's almost about to go under, then they go back to the surface just for a little bit, then come back down. Oh, wow. Back to the surface for a little bit, then just back down. <laughs> Eventually, he opened his mouth and the guy got free, but you're telling me that that animal didn't know what it was doing? Yeah, I, can, I bet he could hear the heart rate or feel the heart rate, feel the stress hormones. Yeah. Or That's the trainer in San Diego, the woman that, uh, and again, I'm a little bit over my skis since I haven't watched it incredibly recently had in some way not rewarded the animal, I believe, for a uh, trick, maybe a lap around with a little fish. Mm -hmm. So it uh, grabbed her and drug her along the surface of the pool underwater until, like, she was scalped. Died, of course, but there was a dinner happening right at the edge of that. Oh, it was I like think the, I saw that. It was the, like, orca experience. I believe it was in San Diego. I might be... Incorrect about that as well. That is a documentary. I watched that. Wow. I have been to SeaWorld before. I had taken my kids to SeaWorld. I will not support an organization that keeps those animals in captivity. Sure. After a while. It was it was powerful. Mm. Yeah, they're they're pretty savage. Blackfish. I think right. so. Michael, can you double check that? It is blackfish, right? Yeah, it's blackfish. Okay. Have you seen that one? No. What the fuck do you do with your time? <laughs> have you seen the movie Old School? With Will Ferrell, where they go back oh, to college. Oh, yeah, the Manson. I know it. Okay. Of it. So you can't even chain together these references because they were driving around in an A-team van, absconding with people, mm -hmm. playing Master of Puppets. So he, yeah, and that so he would have like been like, "Oh, that's a bitch in van," having no yeah. understanding of that's where American heroes come from and that's where they travel. I don't. I, I, I'm worried about today's youth. I want to fire him again. But the problem is I got to immediately rehire him because I'm not going to go over there. <laughs> Maybe yeah. for retention. Oh. Oh, Tillicum. Yeah, that's it. Oh, Jeez. my God, man. And so the dorsal fin is something that happens in captivity that's right. not found in the wild. Whew, man. That's great. Yep. Dragged her into the pool, shook her, fractured much of her body, drowned her, savaged her. Um, Yeah, we'll just let people's imagination. I'm at, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah, during the attack, you probably scalped her and bit off her arm. Tillicum doesn't mess around. Even when SeaWorld staff members had trapped and netted him, Tillicum would not Whoa. let go of the body. That cat just kind of decided he was ready to clock out of this whole thing, huh? Yeah. That's wild. Have you, you know ever wondered have... whether or not were the orca in somebody else's aquarium? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, are we... Because it would be a wild fucking show. Yeah, because they're like, oh, man, look at these idiots keep doing this stuff. Yeah, right? So yeah. We, oh, yeah. we, of course, think we're the smartest of all people, right? Mm -hmm. We're one of the, I think it was the original Men in Black, where they start zooming out and like the Earth is right, in Right, right. And it was on the, the neck. Yeah, the, it was just like an ecosystem inside of an ecosystem. <laughs> right. Yeah, and it was on a cat's yeah. neck. Yeah, yeah. Orion's which is, belt. Indeed. Yeah. I... This is what I do with my time sometimes <laughs> when I can't sleep. But I mean, what? Like, why do we think we're so smart? Why? Why? I think the difference would be the orcas. I feel like they know in their ca they're in captivity, right? Because mm. they're kind of interacting with right. the trainers at the very least. But 
let's say you took a really far objective third person view of just earth i would watch that show yeah it's like the, 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 like the turtle tank and they're just yeah. like oh the guys like, look, look they almost got out uh. yeah we're going from the days of fire and inventing the wheel to now yeah. like they're like oh dude you guys need to tune in they have fucking nuclear weapons and idiots running these countries <laughs> It's, it's like the original. What was what was that show? The Real World. It was like the oh uh, on MTV. Yeah, yeah. God, another thing. I guarantee you. Have you ever heard of the Real World? The transferred layer of oh, road God. rules. What is the oldest show you've ever watched? <laughs> um. Do you not, know who John not, Wayne is? It's not even on. Yeah, TV. I know who John Wayne is. Have you ever seen one of his movies? I think so. Okay. Uh, who else? Steve McQueen. No. I don't know what to think, man. I thought this was Montana. I mean, houses are built on a foundation, right? <laughs> Buildings are built on a foundation. If it's just trash, what do you, what can, what's the most that we could expect? That he'll one day be the recipient of a government program? Is that your apex, Michael? Is that you're just, just looking that way. Living off the government. <laughs> yeah, sucking the government teat, if you will. <laughs> you and all, everyone else in the generation. God. Did you ever heard, speaking of uh, orcas, have you ever heard uh, that they kill great whites at times? Yeah. And when they do, they won't, the great whites will just, just vacate the area for like hundreds of square miles. I'm pretty sure, and I'm not a marine biologist at all. They need to do that by Jocko's house, and I'm down with it. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure the orcas might be at the top of the food pyramid. Yeah, they'll blast a shark. I think they will. Yeah, they'll eat them too, and the and whole they, deal. Well, they hunt in packs as well. Ooh, yeah, yes. and then... Oh, first ever drone footage of what? Oh, God. Oh, sweet. Now we're talking. Okay, so we got some orca. Yeah, those are both orcas. Yeah, but they said after that, like I said, for, for a long period of time, like no great white will come in the area. Like my question is- I wouldn't is, doubt that either. You know, how is oh, that- Oh, David's already injured. Oh, wow. Oh, he's oh, that yeah, thing's he's going to town. I think they're fluid. doing, uh, I think they go for the liver. Is that correct? I mean- God, that would be a – oh, that thing's not even – it's not even using its uh, dorsal. Oh, yeah, anymore. he's just – he's tanked. <clears throat> I mean, but, how, would, how would you possibly ever protect yourself against a swarm of like a half a dozen orca? They're really smart with teeth the size of bananas. But again, no – that I – Michael, will you double check this? No known instances or recorded instances, instances of an orca attacking a human being in the wild. Are they just that smart? They just – they have moral compass? I, I do think – that there have been instances of them actually helping people. Uh, there have been multiple orca attacks on humans in the wild. Uh, Go fuck yourself. But they're less You're just common. making that up right now. I'm not, okay. The A team wouldn't have I mean, that. You, <laughs> <laughs> you asked. Oh, wait. But there have been no recorded killings, but there have been attacks. Mm. Okay, so they're like just little nibs. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Just, All right. We're just hanging. Skinny. Yeah, just, just the tip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're just sending a message is all they're doing. Okay. I was completely wrong, which just, just is why it's good to have somebody double checking me because most of the times I'm, I have no intent to not be inaccurate, but sometimes I just repeat it's shit just, that I hear. It's just barroom talk. No, I'm trying to be honest. Like, I think this is the truth. So, yeah. All right. So we met at in Austin. In Austin. Yes. I'm I surprised so. we didn't cross paths from the CrossFit ecosystem before that. I only went to the games, I think I went in 08 at the ranch. That was the one that uh, Wellborn, because that's where John and I met. Okay. At, uh, I was I still in Highland I physically was games. not there at that one. Oh, that's right. You were doing like caper toss. Yeah, so he, it was weird. I'm like 260 pounds at the time, and everyone across CrossFit is not. Yeah. And so like John walks well, then on. Then there was John. And then and he and I were standing <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the elevator together, we're looking at each other like, what the hell do you do? And I was like, yeah. I don't know. What do you do? Like, yeah, so that was that was back a million years ago but then we kind of met then and then i believe matt vincent like f introduced us introduced okay. us more so and then uh matt's awesome he's been on twice yeah yeah so i've is so, he traveling around just doing van life right now i think so man i mean i've known matt for shoot 15 years or so um i don't know if i could do the van life i know i couldn't i could do it like if i had an itinerary and i was gonna do a couple things and then kind yeah come back from that i want to do my goal my dream is to do like the hunt van life where i would like start in september and then go and like hunt every you know, have a wad of tags yeah and then just hunt my ass off like for two months straight like that'd I be could, amazing i could get down with but that that's only 60 days 
Correct. You know what I mean? You'd need like three months to sleep after that and eat probably. How sweet would that be though? Get like a storage place, pull the van in and just leave it there. And every year you get to cycle through. Wouldn't that be awesome? Like you start, yeah, you'll start like, uh, you know, August you'll hit like mule deer and then just go September and boom, boom, octo go all three through the rut in the Midwest and like end up doing something cool like yeah. down South Texas. It'd be amazing. I think Kip Falks did that the year after he got out of uh, Under Armour. He did that. He went from British Columbia yeah. and hunted his way all the way back 45 days or something all the way back to Maryland. I wonder how he was able to economically survive. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. When you <laughs> when you start that little that little clothing company, eh, who knows, right? Didn't Did he start UA or did he start? the hunt line he and um and uh oh gosh kevin plank were roommates in college so they started under armor together that helps. yeah so he probably was just it was like probably grilled cheese and like tuna packs yeah i would say so probably yeah. a lot of ramen you know swing Dude, by taco bell at night if i had that type of money i would do exactly the 100% same thing 100 percent that yeah 100 percent yeah. Yes. I mean, he had this little badass trailer and he was like, yeah, I got like 12 hunts booked already with all the best guides. You're just like, I'm just going to go do this. And I'm like, I remember. so you have to, you have to build a billion dollar business, sell your shares <laughs> and then so you can get to hunt for a month. I remember in like 2000 and God, it was either 2002, 2003. I had just gotten, I think my first laptop. Mm. And we were jumping out in Arizona, which most people think is hot. It, it is hot many days, but it's also very cold. Extremely. We were jumping at altitude, and I found the Under Armour website, and they were still only making apparel for uh, under football right. uniforms at the time. Yeah, the cold gear, heat gear. Cold gear, heat gear, but a lot of it was abrasion as well, too, because mm -hmm. of the turf. Yep. And I, I think they only had a few options. Yeah. That's when I first found Under Armour. So I was wow. jumping in the early 2000s. That's pretty cool. Yeah. It became, you know. Yeah. Should have bought some stock in that. Yeah. Time. See, so one of the <laughs> – agreed. Oh, my gosh, right? One of the first um, places they tried it out was the University of South Carolina when I was an athlete there. So I had an Under Armour shirt from 97 or 98. That had to have been a very early iteration. It was all white. It was just yeah. all white. So South Carolina football. And my buddy was on the team, and so he traded. So I still have it. I told, I told uh, Kip, he's like, dude, I probably heat pressed that logo on there. Back. I wouldn't doubt it. I, I think yeah. they were doing – isn't that how they were testing their product because they were just providing it to players in they the They were field? all doing the player – yep, that was the whole business model in the early days. And Good then, for him, man. Yeah, and it was, it's, it's just wild to see it, you know. And then and my other friend, <clears throat> Craig Fitzgerald, who was a strength coach, he was like – lived the sweet mates with Kevin as well. And mm -hmm. he was a football player with Kevin Plank. So Kevin was a football player at Maryland. Kip was a lacrosse player. Yeah. And uh, I remember um, – Fitz telling me that Kevin came to him and wanted like 5,000 bucks for, for entry money to help seed money to start Under Armour. And, and uh, Fitz was like, no way, dude, I got to buy a car. It didn't do it. Can you imagine what that 5,000 would have been worth? I think he later got in on it, but still you're just like 5,000 bucks day one of Under Armour. It's yeah. like the guy who, uh, have you heard about the dude who bought a pizza with Bitcoin? And it would have been, I think, in like $18 million worth. <laughs> Can you double check me on that one, Michael? Because this is, again, me repeating shit that I think I saw on the internet. Oh, that's But, it, I mean, I, I think actually Bitcoin just went up over 50. So it would Is have it been, up 50 now? It might have been. Cow. Do you find it, Michael? I know dick about Bitcoin. <laughs> $3.8 $3. <laughs> $3. Holy crap. But it was only one of, the, it was one of the few places you could use Bitcoin at the time. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Spent three point eight billion on pizzas in the summer of twenty ten. Do you have any Bitcoin? Are you like a Bitcoin guy? I a crypto guy. So when I say the term Bitcoin, mm. that is the extent of my knowledge. Okay, we have a club now. <laughs> it's yeah. you and I out of all of our friends that don't scroll, know jack crap. About scroll down, Mike. I want to see the volume of coins that he used. I mean, eleven years ago, oh, using ten thousand bitcoins. <laughs> Michael, Michael, look That's at the cost so of Bitcoin much right now. Money, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh gosh! Every day that guy goes to work is just mad. I mean, I hope he saves some. Like fifty-one thousand eight hundred. Multiply that by uh, ten thousand. Is that going to be fifty billion? Yes. Or five billion? It's either five or fifty billion. Yeah, Where's Glover when you need him? Either, either one. <laughs> Either one. Sucks either way. The purchase work. equated to roughly forty-one dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not laughing at you, sir. I'm laughing with you. Yeah. Is it five bill? 
I think it's actually 500 million. Hold that on. can't be the case. I don't know. Who knows? Well, maybe this was when it was Bitcoin was higher because I think it's been higher. It's a bunch than of this. zeros in there. Either way. Either way, I it don't was got a it. number that exceeds forty-one dollars <laughs> uh, for sure. Yeah, it was, even with the tip, it wouldn't have been. <laughs> Can you imagine being that guy laying in bed at night? Again, like I said, I hope he had another ten thousand that he held on to. Sure, because then he would be great. Because if he didn't, he was like, "Fuck this." Yeah. Also, it, I'm hungry, and it, so that's how he exited Bitcoin. And he works at like the DMV now, and he's super God. pissed off about his life. <laughs> and he tells his buddies on his lunch break, he's like, man, I had $3.8 billion one time. They're like, bullshit. And he was like, no, not really. What scares me about Bitcoin uh, is that I don't know, not only do I not know anything, I mean, I guess I could d- kind of describe what it is. I don't understand the I technology can. behind it. I don't understand where the value is derived from. Yes. All of those. And again, maybe I'm not the target market for it. And I'm, I'm certainly not advocating people not correct research it and invest it. But I just, it scares me. Yes, I'm not. I've also made no effort to educate myself. So, exactly. Yeah. Yes, I've made zero effort. I go, wow, that's weird. It's an imaginary thing that I have no idea about. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll buy ammo. I How know what it NFTs? does. NFTs? Did you ever get into those? No. I, Michael, I'm, that I'm, shit's right in your wheelhouse. Did you ever uh, buy an NFT? No. I, 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 I am so it. non-diversified. <laughs> I have like... That is actually describes my investment strategy. Yeah. I'm non-diversified. All in, no. You need to buy when the stocks are high, sell when they're moderately low. Take your gains and go buy a new car and drive it off the lot. Like that's it in a nutshell. That's what I advise people. To yeah, do. buy buy high, sell low, make up, up make it up in volume. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I've, I've always gone with uh, I, I go with the the more historically, um, you know, diversified in, in land and ammo because I could do things with both of them. The I former could, is probably I, more valuable. Well, with ammo, land. I could take your land. Not mine. I'll fuck you up. <laughs> You can, well, you well can the drive. average guy's yeah. land, or I could keep you maybe from taking my land. Yeah, I'm, I'm obviously, I mean, you this can, is a you can try that situation. one. We could do an exercise with that if you want, but I would maybe pick my neighbors. <laughs> that's just that's just that's just being smart in your target acquisition, or unlucky, depending. Right, right. But the the point, right? It's like okay, well, you know, there's a few things that I I understand. Like, oh, I could hunt this land. I could do all these things, and yeah, I could sell it. Obviously, that's like yeah. 101 based. Investment. That's why I'm not a billionaire, because I do the stuff that everyone else knows. Yeah. Or I, I usually my investment is like machines that I could make my business, and then I could make other stuff. So. How long have you been at the Sornex strength and conditioning stuff? Me, I've been there for 25 years. And it existed before you, correct? Yeah, we're 44 years old. My dad started in 1980. Where did he get when the I was idea for that? He. Uh, since he was a little kid, back to when he was five or six years old, he saw the movie uh, Hercules Unchained with Steve Reeves. Okay. And saw it and was like, whoa, like that's big, strong, like masculine, all the cool things, right? And then. Were they um, wearing Speedos? Uh, furry ones of some sort. I don't know how masculine it is. <laughs> Guy held up pillars. There's Isn't a lot it of weird stuff that, going. like, at the most masculine, like, well, I was just about to say posing competition, which I don't know how well that sentence structures. They're up there wearing grape smugglers with skin that's totally a natural color. And and, and, <laughs> and not, yes, and, and, and the normal thickness of skin, too. Yeah, when you have they're vascular not, they're not laps. dehydrated to the point where they mm-hmm. actually might die. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My favorite stories are how they share suppositories. I don't know that story. Maybe it's better that I don't. I think it was off of like a pumping iron, not the video, but like an mm. article that accompanied that. If you write an article like the shady dark side of weightlifting, I'm oh. like, and tell me more. Yeah, I used to, I used to, <laughs> I used to read a lot of those too. And then I just was like, ah, I know too many people in this world. I kind of like, don't want to know the other side of it. I've been to the Arnold classic enough times that like, I've been there once. The, it was the bathrooms not, are yeah. interesting enough, yeah. uh, you know, with people coming out that seem to have some sort of, histamine response and uh yeah the toilets smell pretty bad from yeah. the samples but anyway so yeah no pops started it back then he he had uh a little bit later on in light like when it seems eight or nine he was in the hospital for a couple of days for something i can't remember what it was but then his dad brought him some muscle and fitness magazines and some outdoor uh, outdoor life or whatever magazines so that's what he was reading and so it's just kind of interesting because the two things that he ended up gravitating towards in life were the outdoors and fitness. And um, It's a good pairing. 
Yeah, right. And he stuck with it. And then that was kind of what I was always around. And so he uh, he was building his first weightlifting equipment when he was maybe nine or ten in his house, in his yard up in New Jersey. I mean, there's a difference between, you know, like Arnold. We'll use him as a, just an example because sure. a lot of people know him. <clears throat> yep. He participated in bodybuilding and strength and conditioning, but he never went down the design of equipment. What was it about your dad that wanted to make him build the equipment? I'm assuming he was using it also, but... Yep. Only child. <clears throat> so uh, his mom was a bar was a, a maitre d' at a um, country club. His dad was a bartender. Abbott and Costello were actually uh, his his dad's customers, which is pretty cool. Michael, have you ever heard the Jeez. name Abbott and Costello? I've heard the name. I don't know who they are. Yeah. Do you know what they did? Uh, Do not Google. <laughs> give me two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. So <clears throat> so he was left alone a lot as a kid. So he kind of had to fend for himself. But yeah. it was like, you know, he lived in New Jersey. So like, hey, don't go like out far, whatever. So he was just in his yard and he wanted to lift weights. And so he was like, well, how am I going to do this? And so he that was when Olympic, like Olympic weightlifting was kind of what they had. It was before powerlifting, really. So he won an Olympic lifting platform. So he lived, his backyard had a fence and then had a railroad track. So he would jump over the fence and steal the giant railroad ties and slide them down the railroad track <laughs> <laughs> and then flip them over the fence. And then he built a, a, a those are not light. No, as a 10 year old kid, that's pretty, he's mastering leverage at that. Oh point. yeah. That's what I'm talking. Yeah. About. That's what he said. And then, then he, he made a vice that clamped at 10 years old, made a vice that clamped on the fence that he would sit there with a hacksaw and, and cut steel tubing. Was he concerned at all about trains derailing in the areas that no, he had taken? The no, 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 not okay. in the least. No, it's, it's New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, Things happen. As I'm thinking through this story, it's like, holy <laughs> shit, people's lives might depend on that rail. Yeah, so if in the, if in the early 1960s, if there were some unsolved train, train wrecks in the Newark area, <laughs> eh, I think the statute of limitations has passed. For sure. Okay. Yeah. So, the, yeah, he started just building stuff in his yard and, you know, and, and just, and then there's another guy, uh, Andy Jackson had Jackson barbell that are like super high end at the time. Yeah. York was the big name. Andy Jackson made the really, really good stuff happen. Only lived like 20 miles away. So on Sundays, uh, when his dad wasn't working, he would take pops to Andy Jackson's place. And if he like got good grades or whatever, he let him like buy a plate or whatever it is. So he, he, he started seeing like, Oh, high end, cool, desirable weightlifting stuff. And then he would go home and build stuff because he didn't. Ha he would read about it in magazines. Didn't have the money, so then he was he was building his own benches and things like that when he was a kid. I want people to think about what you just said for a minute. The behavioral reward, yeah, for a week of good effort doing yep. what you're supposed to was not a video game. It, it was, was a, not. An it was app. a pair of five pound plates from it Jackson. It was a metal plates with which he could sculpt his body into what I'm going to describe as a war machine, having never met your father and having no He's idea what he looks like. Yeah. <laughs> Six, five, two eighty at Holy 73 years old. Fuck. Yeah. He's a monster. And at one time had the strongest hands in the world. And as measured by what? Uh, like grip strength. Yep. Okay. So you never, you never seen the number three gripper, the iron mind gripper, like the cap, they call the captain. I've seen of like the exercise ones. Yeah, there's a company called Iron Mind about 30 or 40 years ago, came up with one they called the Captain of Crush. And it was see, thought to be unclosable by a human. And he was the first person to ever do it. And I mean, at one time, he was the first, the the last, and the oldest at the same time at 57 years old. So that's kind of that. That is one of those feats within the strongman community. It's like, okay, have you closed the number three? It's kind of like, have you clean and jerk 500? Have you done whatever? It's like an Excalibur. No, I have not. I have not either. <laughs> <laughs> but I just grew up like- Can you pick a more approachable number? Like 135. <laughs> two plates, two big, <laughs> two Cadillacs. Well, you can make it look bigger. You use the, the like, you the know, recycled rubber bumpers. Now we're talking. I'll make that thing look now like 225. we're talking. If you drop it really and, and, and slow oh, the yeah. video down, it looks so good. Stack the tens on there. Just oh, fill shit. the barbell up. Be like, how much is it? It's 90. Take Take, seven take, pounds and take your shirt off his way <laughs> so yeah. that was kind of his world like and so he just trained i mean it was kind of weird that you talk about it his reward was more things to that he got to push against and it was always just heavy hard heavy hard heavy hard 
And he what said, "What did his father do for a living? Bartender." Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, so yep. it divergent from divergent his, his yep. dad was doing. Yep, no one. Yeah, and so he was the first athlete in our family, the first person to ever go to college, and uh, so he started wow. he started weightlifting and got strong and. Um, and then one day he went to track like a track tryout because he was training in this little gym and the, he was getting stronger than the guys whose gym it was. The guy was like, "Yeah, I'll go out for track." Basically, come, tell him to beat it. And he was like, "Well, what I do?" He goes, "I'll try to." You know, pops always like Tarzan and stuff like that, so he was going to throw a javelin. He's like, "Cool." Got up there, sucked at it, and he was walking off the field as a freshman in high school, <clears throat> and some guys were throwing the discus. They're like, "Hey, man, come over here and try it." Tried it, and they're like, "Hey, that's pretty good." First time he had some. Um, some accolades or someone mm. poured into him that was older, you know, like, hey, this is good. He was like, kind of like that feeling, only child, like didn't know. Yeah. So made it on the team, showed up and uh, ended up, they won like his, his freshman year, they won like a dual meet against another team. They won by one point that he got a third place and won the one point that won it for the whole team that they weren't expecting. And then he got addicted to that, like most people, yeah. you know, and so then he later <laughs> won two state championships, broke the state record, uh, yeah, let, he just needed the technique. He was already developing and building the strength, and just needs someone to be, believe in him, right? Yeah. And that's what he said later. He's like, I didn't ever, I never liked throwing. I was good at it, but I loved weightlifting. But when you're really, really strong at six five in the 1960s, it works. Yeah, like, like things work out for you. So he ended up getting recruited to go down to the University of South Carolina. First, first person ever in our family to to do college, and he saw it like summer camp. He was like, well, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to be a machinist. Like I like building stuff. Well, like okay, sure, I'll go down and throw a discus for you. I guess. Like went down there, and um, they didn't have a strength and conditioning program because again, 1968. So that was that was still the you'll get muscle bound days, especially in the South. Hmm. Um, so he got down there. He was like, Hey, where's the weight room? They're like, No, you don't need to lift. You'll get muscle bound. Yeah, but isn't that what you're shooting for? Weird, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, yeah, he, I know. That's yeah, the that's byproduct the point. of what I'm looking right. to try to do. So at 18 years old, he borrowed a car, drove back to New Jersey, and pulled his own weights down. And that was the first weight room at the University of South Carolina was the one he built. He got the, – the track team gave him money to build the weight room <laughs> as a freshman. Like, how many how many wild OSHA things are going on in NCAA, like, yeah. this wild stuff? And so they let him, they're like, yeah, if you want to do it, Richie, that's cool. Cause you're like, you know, you're a top recruit and we're going to make you happy. And so he did that. So in a way he kind of did that. And then when he graduated, uh, he wrote the state curriculum for, um, ex for weightlifting and P in the whole state and, and gymnastics. So he was like kind of that early on, you know, per, you know, talking about, you know, physical culture. Have yeah. you ever seen that old video, um, from LaSalle, uh, that video, you see the, like all, all these, uh, uh, kids in California, what was it? The school of LaSalle, I believe in, and they're like 1960s, uh, Stan LaProdi was the coach, but it's, it's been a viral video of these kids in high school. If you could pull it up and find yeah, it. Yeah. I'll see if I can find it real quick. It's badass. It's an, it's a mid 1960s high school. And these kids look like they're straight out of buds, like just chiseled, just chiseled. You would actually be underwhelmed seeing kids coming out of buds. Well, later phases of buds, maybe. No, I mean, maybe. it's like telephone poles and boats. It's a lot of, uh, it's more aerobic right. than resistance training. So Are these just, guys just going to be specimens? Yeah. Look at these cats. This is mid-1960s. Like, like Unacceptable short length. Uh, it's too, they're too long. <laughs> and, I mean, whew, man, we are at a questionable angle to be filming up on that. <laughs> None of those reps count. What is this fucking? Look at the God seagull trippers. They're pretty badass for a bunch of nineteen sixty two high school. Can you imagine kids. telling a modern era high school that that's like, the this outfit is what that you... they're going to wear? Just let's just start with the outfit <laughs> right. itself. There's all kinds of bad gentlemen. Stuff. You're going to be taking. I mean, the pegboard. That's awesome. Pegging means something different to Michael. It's a different vernacular. <laughs> same word, but. That's his generation. It, it truly <laughs> is. That's what pegging used to mean to us. It means right. something different in twenty twenty four. Look so, at this scorpion. Oh, that has yeah, absolutely that was, no that measure was actual, of athletic ability. That was actual <laughs> seal training, though, right? I mean, that would be a move. My <laughs> so God, anyway, so anyway, what is the purpose of that? <laughs> I, I thought I wanted to show it to you because I thought you'd feel at home. I mean, <laughs> they never made us do shit like that. Yeah, you know, you'd be underwhelmed with butts. It's yeah. it, you know, four mile runs, two mile ocean swims. You're doing the obstacle course. You're underneath the log a little bit, but it's aggregated between like six to eight people. Boats are on your head. 
What would you say was the most difficult part of Buds? Common question that I get. It's it's hard. You could say like because everybody is going to have an evolution or something that you're exposed to that you're mm. going to be challenged by. And I saw it often as an instructor. You'd get D1 runners and, and the water would be a challenge for them. Of course. <clears throat> they can either overcome it or they can't. Yeah, you you've know. seen – I mean, you were an instructor, so you've seen yeah. all, all types, right? But some people, let's say it's a – they have a problem procedurally with a diving system. Or mm. maybe some people have a problem – understanding and putting into place the very simple, simple like fire and maneuver drills that we do. So mm. it's hard to say what the okay. hardest thing is. I would say in general, looking at the biggest picture, the hardest thing is that it's a grind for 180 days. That would suck. I do. It would suck. But the three of us right now, and I'll include Michael in this, could make it through any one day of SEAL training. And, mm. and your average person, and I'm okay. by that, I mean, like truly pretty average. We could go back to the coffee shop and not everybody, but for most people, they would physically be able to make it through mm. a day. But what about 179 more? That's the that's the hard part. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. I tell people, you know, get a 100 grit sandpaper and you're like, okay, you're going to take this across your knuckles one time. Most people could do it. Two weeks later, when it's like pussy and blistering and raw, and I keep asking you, you're going to do it one time a day, people reach the point where... They've had enough, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what happens. Yeah, it's a grind. That's a really good way of putting that. Like yeah. that 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 helps. It's the me. totality of sure. what they are asking you to do over time. Mm -hmm. Which, when you understand that, and you go back as an instructor, you realize that the most impactful and powerful tool you have is not the sand, the water, the telephone pole, the boats, the sleep deprivation. We can't. We we are never really able to fuck with their food. That's one thing that mm -hmm. they, they're going to get fed well and eat about every six. There are times where it can go outside of that if the evolution is longer, but they really do guard the caloric intake, which they should, and hydration as well. Sure. But your most powerful tool is your ability to shift or shape the student's perception of time. Mm. You don't have to yell. You can get them cold. It helps when you can combine it with a lot of those other, right, especially environmentals. Get them cold and then talk to them about, how long do you think you can be cold? Because mm. I think, standing here in this jacket steaming cup of coffee that I can be warm longer than you can be colder. I'm going to, you know, just, I'm going to be here for a week. It's going to be me right. and you. This evolution lasts for four hours. It's like, might be a five minute evolution. They don't have to know that. Sure. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I remember you talking about that on that podcast we were in years and years ago. And you talked about keeping your world as small as it possibly can. And Single I, Single most powerful tool that I've ever been exposed to. And I've utilized that so many times after yep. here in other ways. And I've told people, I was like, Hey, I heard Andy say this and it makes sense here. That's how I made it through my divorce. Oh, have you had one of those yet? I have not pussy. So anyway, uh, Michael, I look forward to your first. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. Yeah. He's see, Michael's see, a divorce is something that sometimes after, if you get married, so Mary is what happens when you meet a girl. <laughs> uh -huh. and yeah. <laughs> Where do not on an come app, from? <laughs> not on an app. You talk to him in real life. It's weird. <laughs> Michael's know. newly in love. Oh, good for you. Are you ready to talk about it yet? <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's skip this part. What's your name? I'll talk Googler. about it for you. We can talk about it off air. All right. We'll talk about it whenever I want to. <laughs> <laughs> but out of I didn't respect, know it was Michael's podcast. <laughs> yeah. Out of respect for both of them, I'll leave it. But he officially asked for her hand in love. Hey. <laughs> right on. <laughs> I asked her on a date. <laughs> That's what I just said. Uh, in your own words. Early, in the early, words. Early piece of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, first off, obviously joking. It's awesome that you haven't. It was it was the lowest point in my life and mm. by far the hardest thing I've ever gone through in my life. And there were aspects of, like, so I have three kids, mm -hmm. 20, 18, 15, uh, girl, youngest, boy, boy, then navigating even just the ability to explain what was going on because all they had ever known. His sure. mom and dad. Sure. I will yeah. say in the conversations I've had with them since, they knew their only world was mom and dad, but I think that they recognized that mom and dad's world was a little bit mm -hmm. was was a little bit askew. You know, the foundation had been cracked. But then there's the issue of that. There's the issue of like what is your worth as a man? Sure. I came from a community where the only currency was never giving up, right. never quitting. Right. right. And I was the one who made the decision to initiate. Mm. I, I toiled with that for three to five years. 
talking myself out of it. Of course. And, and I think uh, – I always only talk very broadly, but I think my ex-wife would agree that that would have been a more reasonable timeline. Mm-hmm. Meaning, you know what I mean? Like I think she would arrive at the same place, but – are you a good enough person to be a father? Are you a good enough person to ever find somebody else to be with? Like, sure. is this your life? Like, it sucks. Yeah. And then the divorce process in and of itself, which I would largely describe to anybody who is either looking at this, I would never talk you out of it. I would never try to talk you into it, but be prepared to have your entire life reduced down to an Excel spreadsheet. What is the value of you as a person, what you have done, and potentially what you could do into the future, mm. and be prepared to divide it? True. And not by two. It might be... 60 40, mm-hmm. 70 30, 80 20. At best, you're probably looking at a 50 50. It right. fucking sucks. And you're on these Zoom calls with people <sighs> who are, you know, if you have a business, you're going to have to have people who come right. in and evaluate the business. And both sides can have one. So you can imagine there's a divergence between the values that they come up with and they start arguing, or people are just telling you what it is and who you are and what you're worth. And uh, right. yeah, there are moments like, I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to make it to the end of the Zoom call. And I right. went right back to that lesson of keeping your world as small as possible. I'm going to get through this Zoom call, and I am going to tackle what comes next. I'm going to yep. make it through this fucking day. And eventually, like, it was done. Yep. Um, it was horrible. But at the end of that, you know, you have the rest of your life in front of you. Sure. But that lesson, it, it, I, I think it was reinforced in SEAL training. I learned, I learned it without being taught it from a systematic approach when I was younger. But I think it's the most powerful tool that I've ever actually mm-hmm. encountered because you can apply it anywhere you want to. Yeah, I mean, I agree. When you you said that years ago, it's it's rung in my head. Remember, what was it? Gladiator. Remember, they all throw them in the ring, and they're mm-hmm. like, "What's coming out of that door?" And they're like, "I don't know, but whatever comes out of that door, we yeah. got to deal with." And they're like, remember, like on the old game shows, "What's behind door number two? You're yeah. like, "Fucking sofa set." <laughs> whatever, whatever it is, <laughs> like, Hyundai Datsun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Screw that. But it's just like I always kind of joke, like, yeah. "Hey, whatever comes out of door number two is we're going to deal with it. Like yeah. whatever that is, is we're just going to band up and we're going to get through it." And you know, um, you know, thankfully, uh, my marriage is it's great no divorce in, in the future but my dad on Sa- his says you <laughs> on his second, she might be a lawyer right now honey you're not a lawyer are you no it's closing it's past business hours where you live you're good <laughs> uh my dad's uh second marriage um he he got a divorce but i remember he told me the uh, the lawyer at the time told him which i always thought was interesting he goes listen your life's gonna suck Goes set the clock for about one for one to two years. I can't remember if he said one or two years. Two years, your life is going to suck from today to, for about two years. He's like, get a couch, a TV, and a refrigerator. That's all you need. Rebuild your life. Realize it's going to suck for two years, and go back to life and just get doing it. And then in two years, everything will be kind of clear. But just survive day to day until then. That's how you would talk somebody into suicide. <laughs> They're like, hey, so you have a uh, seven hundred and thirty days that are going to be just real dick stompers. Um, the, the totally I, non way that you did it. I would go the other way. I'd be like, right. listen, man, yeah. it may suck for two years, but put that at, put yeah. that aside. Yeah. You're going to look for putting your foot in front of the other and not pay attention to where you are in that two year story arc and look for victories where you can find them, handle yeah. the things that you can find them and just focused on where you are and what not, not where you want to be. That's why you weren't a lawyer. Mm, that and there was like a, it's like a lot of bar that I, it's uh, called hit the my bar. Head on. <laughs> yeah. I think it's actually called the yeah, bar that I would hit my head on. Yeah. For, yeah. Yeah. My, my mom and dad, when they got divorced, it was very, very amicable. And I appreciate them always handling it. They basically How made old were you? two. Okay. But I, I've, I've heard, they both said they, they, they made two lists and they went back and forth. And, uh, I think I can't remember if like one made the list and one chose. And so that's hmm. something my dad's always taught me since I was a little kid. Like if we had a candy bar. He's like, how you always make sure it's fair. One person cuts it, the other person chooses. Because that way you will all the person cutting will always get close to half as possible because they don't want to ever They want it to be as fair as possible. They want to be as fair as possible. Interesting. They make one makes a list, one chooses. So that way you know no one's gonna load the list in either way. And then you could decide once you've said, Okay, I'll take a list A and take list B, then you can negotiate. Yeah. Well, hey, I really kinda need the garage for this. I'll trade you the this for this for this. You good with that? Yeah, sure. Boom. And that's how they did it. They said it was like an hour and they were done. Are they still amicable to this day? Yep. I'm they, assuming they've obviously moved on in their lives. And they they were divorced forty five years ago and 
my dad still comes at Christmas at my mom's side of the family. Good for them, man. Yeah, they're like they was like, hey, we're we're always going to make sure that Bert never, you know, there was years that they they didn't for sure. But now they're older. They both been remarried. Whatever. They hang out like Thanksgiving, Christmas. Mom was like, hey, make sure your dad's invited. He knows he could go, you know. And Good so, them, so that was a neat like watching that happen because I think it's it's doable. But you got to get egos out of the way, and you got to go like, hey, I I really truly want the best for you, or at least even. And so that was something again that little. I remember to this day, I was seven or eight years old. I had a, I had a candy bar, and I remember Dad going, "You cut it, I'll choose." Fuck, and, that's a powerful lesson. Yeah, and it was it solves all problems. It really does. <laughs> it really does. Or you could cut it off, like off kilter, if you want to be super nice and go, "No, I'll take the smaller piece." Yeah, you you choose what you want. So then you kind of are in control of the whole narrative. Pretty interesting. It is interesting. Yeah, it's a different way to think about it than screaming at each other. Because that works good. Well, I tell you what doesn't work good is both parties getting a lawyer, and then the lawyer takes 90%, and then the two get right. to deal with the 10% left over. Yeah, yeah. That's a good time. That's a good time. And I have another friend that, that – uh, two friends of mine, they got – when they got divorced, the third friend of mine um, mediated it so they didn't do the whole lawyer thing. And he sat him down. He's like, hey, I love both of you guys. And he kind of did the same process. He's yeah. like, let's just talk this through and get it figured out. And everyone kind of walked off and – yeah. You know, I don't know. I I don't know enough about that whole world, but I've seen it done a, a couple times. That were pretty cool, and um, yeah, unfortunately, that seems to be the anomaly. Yeah, yeah, it does, and I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's emotions, ego, emotions, and ego get involved. There's a, uh, and again, speaking broadly, not even specifically about my own situation. There's uh, resentment, anger, of course, you know, all those things that that come into play, and. Mm-hmm. Proven true time and time again, the more you let emotions interact with your decision-making oh process, the poorly the execution of that, the, it just, it's, the scale becomes nonlinear at some point and just takes off. It never really seems to like, ah, that was the, that was the, the, uh, the booster in that whole fight yeah. that I had was when emotion shot through the roof. Yeah, all the, all the bad business decisions that I made. Any, Aren't they fun, though? <laughs> it's really fun to throw stuff through a wall and then yell at stuff. You know, no, it's 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 idiotic. We're not all as strong as you, right? Like I'm, I, I could throw things at a wall; they'd probably bounce off. <laughs> probably, probably. So, did you grow up around a weight stack? Me. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I was clean. So your intro is slightly different than your dad's. <laughs> Mine was yeah. My first double body weight deadlift, I was eight. Yeah, but that doesn't fucking count. So you lifted eighty pounds. One hundred and twelve. Whatever. I was fifty six. I can pick that shit but, right now. But I, but I went to <laughs> I went to school and because uh, we had to write like what was our, our our like best day of our life in third grade. Yeah, and that was the best day of my life. And I remember, I remember my t- my my classmates and teacher must have thought I, my dad was insane or I was a moron. I'm literally telling them my three attempts that I took that day. I was like, well, first I opened up with, and remember the kids are looking at me like, what's this guy talking about? Yeah, these guys over there just like, I'm eating paste. Here. I'm eating paste and this yeah. guy's talking about deadlifting. I don't know what's going on right now. But I remember dad telling me, as like when I was kids, he's like, well, you know, you're, you're a man when you could deadlift double body weight. You're not a man at eight. You're just light. Well. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you're just like, but I remember your strength to weight and ratio and you're is close, good. And you're closer to the to the ground. Yeah, but yeah, no, it was always it, for with him. It was always tests. It was constant tests. It was I was afraid of heights, so we would have like a climbing deer stand in the backyard, and every time I would climb it higher and and put a surveying tape higher and higher, like you know, I might get like a little prize or something on I mean, a little fire starter. So his theory was exposure. Exposure. Identify what you yes. may be scared of, and expose yourself to it over time. And somewhat monetize it. Have, you know, when I first started weightlifting, when I was seventh, eighth grade, something like that, I kind of wanted to do it because kids kind of were starting to get in the idea. I was really skinny and the whole deal. But I also wanted um, money to um, buy Christmas presents that year. And I want to buy my own Christmas presents for people. And he's like, okay, five bucks a workout. Show up, get five bucks. So it was like, you know, an hour or two. It was real training. Like I did the whole thing. But it's also I, real money back then. But it's real money when you're that. Oh, I had like a hundred or two hundred bucks, and it was like you know I was. But I, I the pride that I had of like going, my mom taking me to the mall, and I got to do all my shopping with money that I made that I worked for, and you know, and that was. We laugh later, you know, you know, basically running the company, and I was like, that was a good two hundred bucks I spent, wasn't it? And I'm like, yeah. well, you, you you kind of formatted me to realize that hard hard work, something comes from it, and then you could have that pride that goes with it. So. He had the, the overnight 10-year success, if you will. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> how to build a world class brand in forty short years? Oh God, isn't it amazing how people will not pay attention to those thirty nine and three quarter years and oh see gosh. the last like fiscal quarter? Yeah, yeah. They're like, you guys killed it, and I go, you have no idea. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. July 1, 1999, when I clocked in and I haven't clocked out, but I was also working in the shop, grinding steel and stuff five years prior to that or 1992. So seven years when all my friends had sweet jobs at the mall and everything like that. And I'm getting freaking arc burn, sunburned eyes and all that <laughs> shit. Cause it you was don't... literally sunburning your eyes. Oh yeah. It's called arc weld burn. So like, you know, they said, don't look at a weld while it's yeah. going on. It'll burn your eyes like a sunburn. You don't know it till that night when you Where go to sleep. Where were your glasses? Well, you're, I'm running the saw, so I'm doing other stuff. You're over there, you know, and I'm not wel wearing a welding hood. So, you're like, you're a dumb... Dude, if I had a welding hood, I'd wear that shit everywhere, to include driving at night. <laughs> exactly. I was rocking. Just high beam that shit. Yeah. So, yeah, you're sitting there... Cop like, pull you over, like, I didn't see that stop sign. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I can't see nothing. But, yeah, you get it, and you, and you wake up at, like, 2 in the morning, it feels like you're getting hot sand poured in your eyes. And you freak out at first because you think you have eye cancer. <laughs> so you know? let me ask you this. Yeah. After the first time that that happened, did you change anything? Yes. Okay. That is one thing that I do have. <laughs> <laughs> I adapt quickly. Okay. <laughs> I adapt quickly. And I was actually thinking about this the other day. I was interested to what your thoughts would be. Um, I, I enjoy deer hunting a lot. And so, you know, I'm always like trying to find the biggest deer, blah, blah, yeah. blah. And you guys like, got probably what? White tail down in South White tail. Yeah. Right. They're, they're kind of small, but they're ninja deer. Cause we have a really long season and you could shoot them with a rifle forever. And so just okay. generations of ninja deer. Yeah. <clears throat> but you kind of like, okay, how did deer get big? It's a, it's a like, are the big ones smart or the smart ones big? Like which one? Chicken like, before the egg. Thing, right. Yeah. And then, so what I kind of realized one day when I was sitting in the stand for 12 hours in Missouri, it was... The ones that figure out the game first go ghost. They just learn to hide mm -hmm. it when when they're still a small enough buck that no one shoots them. They learn it when when they're not on the menu yet. Yeah, when they're four, but they can see the table. Yes, they figure out the game before the other ones do. Yeah, and then those guys go ghost. Thus, they eventually get big. Because the ones that are big that walk across the field, they get shot day one. Yeah. And I started thinking about. It. I was like, wow. Well, velocity of adaptability is generally that and resilience are the two things that I've found success wise business, it, just about anything, but like where there's hunting now, look at the other side, like, okay, well that that's how they survive. And I was yeah. interested. I was thinking about this on the plane right in here. I was like, what are your thoughts of how fast one can adapt to it? Generally, from my opinion, I would think on the battlefield as well, Oh yeah, is who's going to win? Is who figures out the freaking game first? Or I was listening to your podcast a couple of days ago when you were talking about L ambush. Yeah, and it's like, what is the what was the ambush? Is to cause someone to have a hard time making decisions. Yeah, you need to make them reactive while you're proactive. Sure. So, but if you remove that variable and they can make decisions faster and they figure out the game faster, you're fucked. It's, right. it's the same thing as the OODA loop. Correct. You, yeah, yeah, you could get inside the loop, right? Yeah, the observe, orient, decide, and act. And the goal Correct. of that is to make yours as small as possible while trying to make the... Trying to widen theirs. Trying to widen theirs. So it's, it's yep. basically talking... I think you're onto something there. I mean, if you had 10 human beings and you were to rate success, let's say 10 human beings, same background, they're all... Right. Not that this could be the case, but they're identical. Mm -hmm. And you're going to challenge them with an identical business problem and you're going to... Yes. The result will be metric-based based off of whatever variable it would be. Sure. The people that are going to rise to the top, there would be two ways that they would rise to the top. One would be like, in my opinion, something that is explosively innovative that might disruptive be, technology. Yeah, that would probably catapult you. Of course. Other than that, it would be the people that recognize what's going on earliest yes. and adapt. Yes. And what I've always seen is passion. Innovation is a huge part of it. And some people have it, some people don't, right? I mean, yeah. if you're going to change someone's buying habits, you're going to do it one of three ways. You're going to give them the same product for a lower price, okay. a better product for the same price, yep. or have disruptive technology that changes everything. I would agree with that. Those are the three ways that you change someone's buying habits. So generally, you have passion is what starts the whole process. Passion is the thing in, that I've found that will generally give you enough longevity to get the reps in. If you love something, it'll cause you to maybe have a little bit more resilience than you would if you just kind of liked it. And so when it's not fun anymore for most people, because everything is cool, like SEAL training ain't that bad one day. But yeah. when this shit stops being fun, 
Like the second day. Like the second day, <laughs> right? But but exactly. But because in the second day you go, I got it. Oh do. fuck, I can do basic math. There's a lot of these days. <laughs> There's left. A lot of these. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you had the passion for wanting to be a seal. Yeah. That breeds more resilience because there's a lot, a lot of dark days in that amount of time. And then the ones who start pulling ahead, and I kind of you, t- you hear about people say, "Oh, well, they're, the whole wealth system is going to have to reboot, reset, or everything." Most of the same guys are going to end up with the cash again. Yeah, I would because agree. Because they, the ones that now have, they understand how to figure out the game faster. Now, some of them fell ass backwards into for it. sure, and some of them inherited exorbitant levels sure. of you know generational wealth. Correct. So you can't really re- redo yeah. that, but. I truly believe in every game competition, the ones who figure out and get inside that OODA loop and figure out the game faster than the other guy could start making moves. And I've been on both sides of that. I've been on I've been on the side of guys that figured out way faster than me, yeah. and I had to get my dick kicked in. Then I had the passion and resilience to stay in the game and then start making moves. And I've had times that I was first to the trough, and you're like, okay, that's a nice, that's a nicer position to yeah. be in, right? I've never thought about SEAL training and the people who make it through through the terms of passion, but, you know, the it's the reps that people don't see that lead you to success mm-hmm. that they don't understand. Um, but what is the driver of that? In my opinion, I'm interested. It what shouldn't you think. be money, is my opinion. Right. I mean, it, uh, fuck, it's hard to say that because there are economic requirements for everybody. The number of people who reach out to me, like, hey, I want to start a podcast. Mm -hmm. So how does this advertising model work? It's almost, it is almost always that. And I'll be very clear. The podcast was somebody else's idea and a Mm -hmm. 511 Tactical bought me the equipment and Mm -hmm. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And I didn't know that I was going to enjoy it the way that I was. I didn't also know that there was a monetization aspect to it that came later on, Mm -hmm. but for the people who in that first email talk about, hey, this is what I want to do, and they're already talking about the money question. I think they miss it. You're probably, unless you come to it with a like a celebrity type name or an embedded yeah. audience that's going to catapult you to a place where advertising mm-hmm. brands are going to look at you for monetization. <clears throat> yep. And let's assume that somebody's super interesting, but they don't have that. It's probably a 24 to 36 month endeavor. Yes. If you are not passionate about it, you You're, won't make it through the dark because you won't do the reps. Yes. Yeah. That is my full point. You get, you nailed it because it's not that freaking fun yeah. <laughs> in the first parts, right? If well, seal training really... isn't fun, and I bet you that most people there have some level of passion. The ones who are at the end of it are the ones that can put that passion above everything else mm-hmm. because they realize that at the end of the day, it's worth it. That drives. Yes. And passion burns so deep yes. that they can look at that versus the obstacle that's in front of yes. them. Yes, and the passion gets manifested as resilience, physical resilience. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if they'd be interchangeable terms, but they, I would say synonymous in ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, I mean, I look back at my sports career. Yes, it's, you know, the whole, th- obviously not as difficult as your training, but there were certainly days where you're pissing shit blood, shit and blood. I, stuff did, for... I did that zero times for clarity. Okay. Nope. Well, I did it. I'm just out of so. curiosity, why? Were you pissing and shit? Uh, well, because squatting way too much, way too many reps. That makes you piss blood. And when you strain that hard, oh yeah. Yeah. I'm going to use that as my number one excuse for why I don't lift heavy. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no. Like, why don't you back squat 135? Like, I don't want to piss blood. I don't want to piss blood. Yeah, you guys anymore. don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So, and then, and then guys, with, you'll, you'll develop some awesome hemorrhoids, and then those bleed a lot too. Hemis? Get it. And a lot of, a lot of it's More than just an engine, you know what I mean? <laughs> more than just an engine. <laughs> so, but those are those days, like hammer throw. You, It's so freaking technical and yeah. such a pain in the ass that you, and it's the most technical track and field event. You, event, you get no oh. girls, and there's no money in it. So, if you're going to. We don't get any girls. Well, there are the pole vulture girls that are around. Those are pretty hot girls. All right. But no one cares because you're a <laughs> hammer thrower. How many times have you seen a hammer throw in real life? That many times. Oh, exactly zero. Ex- my point. It's probably single digits that I've ever seen it on a digital medium of any kind. My point. <laughs> <laughs> my point exactly. Yeah. So people are like, hey, you're a big dude. You play football. You're like, no, nah, I threw a hammer. They go, cool. And they walk away because they don't. They, it's dumb. I think it would be cooler if it was like a framing hammer. Well, I would pre- per- I would have been pretty gnarly at that back in the day. Yeah. But that all being said, so you got to love it so much because yeah. you got to do 10,000 reps a year. 
So there's so many days you're like, why in the am shadows. I? Ten thousand. Yeah, why in the am shadows. I throwing spinning around to the left? And I trained for the 2000 and the 2004 Olympic trials by myself in a gravel parking lot for five years. Do you ever practice spinning the other way? I do. Everyone says like, oh, you got to do that. Like right, but the reps. You, you, your body can't handle the volume of doing that velocity. Yeah, I was going to say that much imbalance. Well, yeah, because, I mean, I still, my trap, I, I haven't thrown in almost 20 years. Tw yeah, this will be 20 years since I competed, competing. And this trap and this back is still twisted because I tr pulled as hard as I could for 15 years that way. <sighs> so it would be like, you know, you're shooting right-handed. Well, don't you ever shoot left hand? Yeah, we yeah. have. But you're not as good at it, nor do you have the time to do the yeah. 100,000 reps, right? So, you know, as I started kind of building this like model, of like, okay, passion, why, why do we keep doing this thing that, you know, make that you make zero money on? Right. I would add also to the passion. There are some things for people that just, it fills their cup and maybe that's a different way mm -hmm. to say passion. Yeah, maybe so. You know, like, like I don't, I know nothing about coding. Right. So I don't know how you could be passionate about that unless it clicks with you and who yeah. you are and it fills your cup. You know what I mean? So it like, massages that little part of the yeah, brain. Yeah, so not sure. the same thing, but maybe – but again, that is what gets you through the shadowy days where yes. like nobody's – this is never going to work, but you still mm – -hmm. I'm going to say stand at your standing desk you know, because better than sitting down in front yeah. of your computer. Yeah. yeah, there's got to be something there. There has if to there's be not something. something there, I just – I think your odds of being successful in the long run – I think it's almost impossible. Yeah. I mean, because it always, a business, anything <laughs> always takes longer than you think. It never follows the business plan yeah. that I've seen. Um, and so like, that's kind of, I mean, I look back at the old day, like shoot 99 through 2010 or 11 at Sornex was hard as shit. Like, like ridiculously hard. How was it before that, before that time period? <laughs> hard as shit. <laughs> How was your dad as a businessman? Uh, neither one of us are good. I'll just okay. be honest. We have a lot of passion, thus we have resilience. Yeah. So we've we've just kind of never quit when we should have. It was like if Bud's was like 400 days and you're like, seriously, dude, you're still doing this? You're like, yep, yeah. I'm going to be a SEAL one day. Like, it's kind of so bred into us that we're just kind of like, oh, we're just going to keep doing it. I mean, yeah. I've, had, I've had bankers, CEO groups, everyone say, hey, you got to come up with the exit plan. Like, this isn't going to work. Blah, Meaning blah, blah. you two guys have to detach as the- Yeah, you know. like like you should sell it. You should, like, you need to do, this isn't a feasible business thing. Yeah. Um, and, and you're like, okay, cool. But you're in the, in my mind, it's like, no, this is what we do. Like, this is what we do. Like, we're just going to keep doing it. Yeah. This is what we do. So taking a little bit of, of your- Kind of daily thing, something I had in – my dad got prostate cancer. I, I just got finished my Olympic attempted career, 04, kind of come off that, hey, didn't make the team, kind of bummed as shit. Grandmother dies. I'm executive of her will. Two months later, Pops gets prostate cancer. At the time, it's only he and I at Sorenex. So all of a sudden, I'm running Sorenex, also worrying about my dad dying. And then, you know, all these other things just – flip upside down yeah and so i'm rebuilding the gym at night i'm running sornex off of his uh kitchen counter um you know with i think we had wi-fi i think we had like web tv or some crap like that Fuck at yeah. his house right i'm running sornex off his place we don't have a we don't have a brick and mortar we get a new place i'm going i'm getting off work that night i'm building the new place doing all, all that stuff and i'm using a credit card paying for subway sandwiches and firehouse sub sandwiches for all my buddies helping me do drywall work. And like, and there was this like couple years, like especially Oh five. And I just remember like every day, like the, the mantra was I would tell my dad like in physiological terms, but also myself in business, don't die today. Don't go out of business today. Maybe tomorrow. Just don't do it today. But also maybe not tomorrow, you know? <laughs> Maybe not tomorrow would really help be helpful, yeah. but I can't promise but that. But just not today. But I know by end of business day today, if we're still here, like we might be way behind on money and the whole thing, but like we didn't die today and the phone keeps ringing. So if more people keep calling, I'm going to keep doing the thing and I'm going to travel like them. And then like a year later, it's like, don't die this week. Yeah. And then a year later, it's like, hey, don't die this quarter. And then a couple years after it, you're like, hey, it's hard. It's business. But, yeah. 
but that was kind of to talk about your like my world was so small at that point i could have never thought like this is a sustained thing i'm gonna have to do for years and and my dad the fastest way for you to fail in that moment would have been to think about it in oh, terms of it years. Was, it would have been horrible you, i don't think the brain is designed to be able, no you just that can't, amount of stress i couldn't have taken or suffering on. or whatever you right. would describe yeah. it as your 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 fucking circuits will fry yeah yeah, Pops gave all, like, he didn't have a lot of life savings, but he dumped it into the business to help pay bills. He's sitting at home post surgery with like a minimal, minimal, minimal salary, like just mm -hmm. enough to pay for food and his rent. And he looked at me, he's like, All right, I just, I just put in my life savings, which I did too. And he goes, I trust you that you could do this. I hope you could pay me back one day. Like, as in, like, he's a 55 year old man that, just dumped it all in there and I'm and I'm having the pressure of the world on me going I have to somehow save this thing and pay him back a couple hundred grand okay so I know what I can't do is stop yeah. <laughs> right that's when quitting isn't the option and it's like okay don't die today like you better figure out how to do plumbing you better figure out how to do those things right and so like that period of time was just freaking hard man like it just it just sucked looking back on it can you identify like a singular low point yeah when those days when i was wondering like is pops's scans going to come back post cancer is so it, the combination of business the combination of that yeah i mean our, our our one of our major producers that we're working with they went with another company kind of end run us on something so it was like three big hits so you say like you're fun got, how that all happens at this like why don't the successes hit like that? yeah right yeah <laughs> oh so you'll I never might... believe the phone call i just had i won the lottery in the morning <laughs> right, right. we the... found a grandmother that had three million or 300 million in generational wealth it's all to us <laughs> the best day ever yeah and a free car just got delivered to the it's house the craziest yeah. thing yeah so it was like okay don't have a producer don't have a brick and mortar and your partner and founder might die Cool. I wonder what percentage of people even presented with that, regardless of the the business model that they're in, would just throw the towel in. I feel like it's astronomically high. Probably much higher than I thought. Yeah. It, the weird thing, it doesn't make me tough. It probably just makes me dumb more than anything. I never even considered that as a thing. And for some strange reason, I never considered we were going to fail. Is there a benefit to being slightly smooth-brained? 100%. I feel like... Yep. Like my middle son, Tyler, that you met, who mm -hmm. is, um, I call him Gordon Cuckler. Because uh, now, has he talked with you, Michael, yet about his investment strategies? Oh, that's, yeah, you talked to me yeah, for like he was 10 getting minutes on today. <laughs> okay, yeah. He was trying to tell me about the resistance in a stock that I didn't understand, A, the terminology that he was using, or B, he's so fucking smart. Like, yeah. I, I can tell you where he didn't get that from, me, right? <laughs> I think exceptionally smart people can do amazing things mm -hmm. but it might take just just a touch of maybe the tism or a little smooth brain for the rest of us to be able to hammer through these obstacles dude <laughs> dude delusionment <laughs> is a superpower yeah it, it, it's it's and i know i have it and i've just embraced it i was like okay i'm generally going to be really optimistic i and i used to have it typed on my computer it said above it says uh you have not won, comma, yet. I, I always knew I would. I don't even know what that definition is. I don't know what it is. I don't think you need to. You don't. Yeah. Right? But the idea is you haven't won yet. And, and everything I've ever done, I've just believed it's going to work out. I just believed I'm going to put my head down and eventually I'll look up one day and I'll be a considerably different place than I was when I put my head down. And, and, and you will be as long as you don't quit. Correct. Goes was, back to your, I remember you saying that, right, left, right, left, and they got to yeah. feed you every six hours. I've and, heard a lot of people say for a variety of different reasons and in different sectors of their life, they'll say things like, fill in the blank made me quit. And I want to say, repeat that sentence. Fill in the blank, somebody, something, whatever, mm -hmm. made me quit. Like they forced you to quit? Right. What do you mean what? they made you? They made. Yeah. They forced you to stop putting in effort? Somebody right. got in between your ears and took, they, you became a marionette doll, and right. they are the ones that took control of yeah. your body? Yeah. yeah. The only person that can actually make you quit is yourself. Yes. And that sucks 
to realize. <laughs> yeah. Because it removes a lot of your convenient excuses. Yes. It was cold. Got it. I was tired. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> I was out yeah. of money. I get it. Yeah. It made me quit. What did? Oh, you gave up. You chose to let those variables yeah. change you. It's it's interesting. Uh, so when you said that, and then I kind of was thinking through that, that's been a very interesting parallel that I probably had in a similar circa time where you yeah. were having that same thing. I was talking to Jocko a few years ago and um, we were talking about lifting and I said something about snatches or something like that. And I was like, what's your favorite? He goes, well, I do snatches. And I, I remember going, you're still doing snatches? And, and he looked at me, he goes, you're not? And I went, well, well uh, and he goes, oh, you submit, you submitted. And I go, what are you talking about? He goes, you submitted the movement. I'm like, like, what, what does you, that even mean? What does that even mean? Right. And so I was like, I kind of dug in. He goes, well, you, did you used to do them? I said, yeah. He goes, well, then you stopping do them, doing them. One day you will not be able to do them because you involuntarily submitted that movement. And I go, there's a lot of flaws in that logic. I used to shit in my pants when I was young. <laughs> well, you I know? did earlier. <laughs> God, I had after my surgery. Oh boy. I'm down like three pair, dude. <laughs> Perfect. But my favorite pair of boxers is a ah, garbage can ah. somewhere between. You own boxers, huh? Yeah. What are you going with? I got boxer briefs. I like the, the That's stretchy. What, yes. Yeah. I mean, the you're boxer not, you're shape. Not, you're but not going like, like old man, like like Walter Mathel briefs. I oh, know that's at age fifty five and above. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, with a questionable dick hole that might be like it, your dick might be hanging out of it. Fifty percent <laughs> of the time it is actually. Yeah, yeah. So so Jocko, it was interesting, and and so I said, we got into it, and he goes, "Oh, it's just ego." Then I go, well, "What do you mean?" He goes, "For the love of Christ, Jocko, take a fucking rap off." Hey. But he was right because he goes, how dare you? He goes, oh, because you used to be really good at it and could do a lot of weight. And because you can't anymore, you've decided not to play the game anymore. I mean, there's other things in that. You just described that one of your shoulders is completely cattywampus to the other. Sure. And I'm not saying you shouldn't sure. or can't snatch, but like, hey, man, maybe I realized that the yep. volume or the way that I used to, maybe now I use dumbbells instead of a barbell. Like, But you know what? I went home and I snatched the barbell and I proved to myself I can still do yeah, you it. You knew that before. Yeah, but I didn't want to admit it because the barbell or Where's a your Jocko tattoo? Where is it? I have no tattoos. Bullshit. None. Do you have a fucking tramp stamp on your back that says good? <laughs> it's the front. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm like the only dude that doesn't have a tattoo. That's my tattoo is no tattoo. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. I get it. But I, I love the whole idea of submit your ego, not the movement. It's me, you not the movement. And so that's why I've been kind of re- Jesus Christ, that's fortune cookie logic. It's so good, though, isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I went home. It's I was like good. snatching 95 pounds. I'm like, I might not ever go above that, but I know I can still do it, which I'm I'm good with. Yep. I'm Actually, with. that is an argument for shitting your pants once in a while, too. I know I could do that. Exactly. I know. <laughs> but if a period of time goes by, questions arise. You, you got to put it back <laughs> in the rotation. You can't. You Sometimes you don't. need to play airport ceviche roulette. <laughs> Jericho and I, when we were doing the fucking triple seven, actually, I think we had talked Logan into it as well. We were going to do either only airport sushi. Oh, nice. Or airport ceviche, which <sighs> airport ceviche in the seven continents that I traveled through, oh. didn't see ceviche one time or actually sushi. We were so fucking tired, like three days into it. Can you imagine the intestinal roller coaster of doing seven continents of airport just sushi alone? That would have been that would have been the most impressive portion of that whole diaper year. required. What was the coolest <laughs> jump that you guys had? Uh, I thought Antarctica? it was going to be. I thought it was going to be. It was certainly the most remote. It looked like snow capped mountains. Mm -hmm. um, not like out here because there was no trees. But dude, exiting over the pyramids. Yeah, that's fuck cool. me. That's cool. That was it. I don't know how it could be topped. I really don't. That was dope. I was telling, actually, you know, Jericho and Logan again, mm -hmm. they were very, uh, they're early in their jumping career. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, I said, hey, guys, um, I don't know if you realize this, but you're already at the top of the mountain. And yeah. the rest of this might be a touch boring for you. Right. You're going to go to the DZ for a day and go jump over the top of a linear runway. Yeah. You've hit, you know, <laughs> yeah. pyramids of Giza, Antarctica. Barcelona, Austin, like you've done the coolest of fucked. the cool. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> you like, have yeah. done this in reverse order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then you just got to go find something else cool to do. I think Jericho went and did like some high altitude stuff. It was in it was in a Nordic country. I can't remember exactly which one. 
there's always ways, right? Like mm-hmm. you, there's always, it's the same thing as you can't do a barbell snatch anymore and, or maybe you're just exhausted by it. Mm-hmm. Do the same movement, but with a dumbbell, you sure. might actually reignite or find something else that yeah. you like about it. You yeah. know, you can get to these end states different ways. You can, you can. And I, I've actually kind of refallen in love with some of those movements because I have zero ego in them anymore. Like, ah, clean 135 pounds. That was How much cute. do you lift anymore? Quite a bit. Uh, recently I've been going five days a week, 6 a.m. Okay. But but my my volume and intensity is not that high. My goal right now is consistency. I want to have accumulated volume through consistency, and that's more of a of a mental and habitual thing I'm trying to work on. I I'm not a morning person. I trained at four to five o'clock yeah, my rough. entire life, and so now I'm like, okay, can, when the alarm goes off, will you get up and go? do a, a bike or a rower for two songs. Will you then push or pull the sled for two songs? And then we do a complex movement. I like how you chunk it. It's, people think, ask me how I have structured workouts. And, oh, what's the biggest set you've ever done? I'm like, probably three. Yep. Like, what do you mean? I'm like, I just count to three in my head over and over and over again. <laughs> I seriously do. Like, yeah. even like yeah. when I was doing I CrossFit stuff. Yeah. Fran, a very traditional 21-15-9. Right. Front squat to overhead press, call to thruster in their vernacular, and a pull-up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why count to 21? Maybe one, just two, count to seven. Yep. Maybe go one, two, one. Two. Like yep. there's so many mental yes. games that you can play with yourself that will allow you to achieve things that people will scratch their head. Yep. And it's just in how you think and it's talk just, to yourself. It's just the batching and the phrasing. Yeah. It's if I could get up. Like the two song thing is perfect because you don't necessarily know what song is coming on and you can get lost in that. It's, it's going to be that. seven to 10 minutes. Yeah. I'm going to like the Unless songs. Unless it's T-Swift, you know what I mean? Or, or Michael an, is a Swift Anna Gata DeVita. Yeah. <laughs> 17 Anna Gata DeVita, damn, that's a long one. <laughs> 17 yeah. minutes. <laughs> you're like, oh, fuck. Yeah, but, but you're like, I could do this. And then you kind of hear it coming, like, all right, just push a little harder, you got it. Yeah. yeah. But what I've noticed is if I do that, that's 10 songs I did bikes for this week. That's 10 songs I pushed yeah. sled for. And so I'm seeing results just in that, like, workouts I usually would have done before and gone, I didn't do shit. Yeah. But I'm going to come back and do it tomorrow again. Well, we got to be realistic on the number it says on our driver's license, too. <laughs> that is bicentennial, <laughs> babies. You got to freaking be. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll, I'll get done. I'll gent most days. I'll walk down and I'll get in the pool, which is usually 40 degrees ish because yeah. it's cold. cold plunges, yeah. And, and, you know, there's there's varying degrees of physiological benefit from that. But a part of that is also I don't feel like doing this. Yeah, I'm going to walk in there. It's I'm, I'm going to do it, and I'm going. To, people, how long? I do it till I reach mental stoicism, till I walk in. I go, and when I finally go, I could be here forever. All right, then I'll leave. Hmm. That could be in three breaths. That could be two minutes. All I'm trying to get is control of my breathing, emotionally pull out whatever I have, control the moment, and go. Yeah, I'm good. And then I just go take a shower, and that's that. How has your body tolerated the volume you've worked out over time? Um, I, it, it, I'm i not nearly as sore as I was when I was hitting bigger training sessions with higher intensities. Yeah. Um, the, the, I mean, I'm getting leaner. I'm like a lot of good hormonal things are happening, and I'm actually starting to become more and more of a morning person doing it that way. So usually I'll give myself two days off. Usually it's Saturday, Sunday, but mm-hmm. sometimes maybe if I'm just banged up on a Wednesday, I'll take that off and then, then curl it back in. But I try to go five days and I try to always adhere to like the 6 a.m. <clears throat> For me, that's, it, again, it's more mental reps than anything because the, the weight isn't much. I mean, you are close to the same age. What are your thoughts on the hormonal stuff? You brought it up. What are, what are your thoughts on things like TRT as we age? I think TRT is great. Yeah. I've been on six, seven years, something like that now. I started a month ago. Okay. I had what my, are your results? I can't Feeling fucking, good? Well, yes, but here's the thing. Mm-hmm. So right around the time of my surgery, yep. I had had my blood tested yep. right before that. So I had gotten the results, mm-hmm. and then I got a tummy ache, which is what – I'm a tummy ache survivor. I was – I was brave though. You yeah, know? yeah, like, you, you big. Yeah, I made it through the valley of. I'll send you a. I made it through the eye of the needle in the valley of death. I found a shirt online that said, "I have a tummy ache, but I'm brave." I ordered that fucking thing immediately. <laughs> I feel like it's coming from China because it hasn't shown up yet, but I'm gonna wear that shit. Yeah. My wife literally looks at me and is like, "What the fuck is wrong with you?" Because I kept telling her, "It's just a stomach ache. What are they gonna do for me? Uh, they're gonna zip you open they're, from they're fucking gonna, top. They're gonna, to- <laughs> they're gonna, they're gonna yeah. brave heart you, dude. Apparently, they had every inch of my intestines out, Shh. physically present, not mentally aware." But my testosterone was barely. Do you ever worry over that, like if other crap like got like stuck to your gut and then they crammed it back in, like a, like a pair of scissors? 
Yeah, like a, some leaves and shit. I don't know. Like well, some random, okay, Bert, random why things. Why were there leaves in the operating room? I don't know. Okay. Like, let's keep just, our just fantasies de, in de, check. Debris. De, Debris. De, Debris. Yeah. Just, just weird things. No. I'm just really glad the last thing I remember is the anesthesiologist and like, hey, I'm going to give you something for the pain. And I was like, mm. what happened? <laughs> That's a good deal. <laughs> Yeah. I didn't. That I didn't. I don't even think he gave me the countdown, or I was so blitzed out of my mind on nice. the pain meds that I didn't. Nice. I literally the last thing I remember is, Andy, I'm gonna give you something for the pain. Then I was just like, Yeah, and then this the time machine. You wake yeah, up. I was shaking. Like, yeah, I was. I was cold, but your guts all. How do they get the guts the same way? You don't have to worry about it. Your body repackages it. Really? That's why one of the main reasons they want you to walk so much afterwards ah. is start settling it. Things I didn't know until this mm-hmm. happened to me. Mm-hmm. Because I was, why the fuck is there this emphasis on walking? Yeah, they said that uh, even heart surgery, and everything that like they have you walk the first day, that the recovery yeah. shoots way up. That's all I and as soon as they told me I could walk, I was up in the morning like three to five miles yep. per day. Like my Jeez. recovery has been fast, but I also started. Um, it's more than just TRT. So I'm working okay. with a company called Merrick Health. Okay. The about enough blood where I was like, I don't know if there's any more left in that for the sure. vials for the initial <laughs> right. test. Oh, yeah, you're the, you're yeah, just I'm belt like, fed. I'm not a fan. Like, I don't mind needles, but I'm not going to sit there and be I, like, oh, can you just no, put it in a little? Uh, no, no, I freaks me out still. I yeah, so it. I just avoid that. And yeah. i like, I'll look back and I'm it's just YouTube like. YouTube. Yeah, doing but it, it, yeah. like as they keep and uh-huh, then I see uh-huh. you start hearing the glass clink because yep. there's so many. I'm like, ma'am. Looks like they have a rack of shots. Yeah. Going do on. we have an end state to what's going on here? Because I have to drive home after this, and do I need like an IV of orange juice or what? Yeah. Oh yeah. My numbers sucked. Okay. Um, they did. They had all of the uh, a, a lot of markers, and they did basically a red, yellow, and green. Mm-hmm. I think I had. There was probably. F- God, I don't want to overstate this, so I'm doing this off of memory, and I'm actually I want to do an episode like a Friday one, shortly, and just be. Because my thing is like I'll be completely fucking transparent about it. I don't I don't give a shit. It's amazing to me how many people I know who are the opposite. Oh yeah. I'm like, hey guys, like it's it's okay. There shouldn't be this stigma around right. this, unless you're trying to do something physical yeah, wise yeah. and lie to somebody. Then then that's also Shh. that's fucked up for a different reason. Yeah. But yeah. so I call it thirty. There was maybe four in the green. Mm. And so I'm looking at this paper. I got sick to my stomach, like looking at the paperwork. Sure. There was a couple in the yellow, low range of the yellow. Mm. And then there was the red. Yeah. So after the surgery and all the stuff ended up showing up, I have not missed. Uh, I take pill uh, supplements morning, midday and night. Thyroid. Like, thyroid support, yep. support, berberine, DHA, progest, yeah. progest, what fucking pro, whatever, yeah. whatever it is. Starts with a P. Yep. Vitamin uh, D, huge D three and K two, omega, yeah. magnesium at nighttime, um, and there's, I, I, I had to, I found a cool little pillbox that I can individual days and they're individually broken. Yep, out. I got mine literally in the car outside. <laughs> and yep. so, and then testosterone up to the two on an insulin needle three times per week. Wednesday, Monday oh, was insulin Friday. needle. Yeah. So, so you you are taking barring one thing is exactly what I'm taking. Well, yeah, I also reason I'm wearing this watch and then I got a chest strap for jujitsu is I'm trying to get a better handle on my sleep. So mm-hmm. I've been no screen time within a couple hours of going to sleep. Nice. The one thing I've determined that has fucked me up is when I eat, when I go to bed, I need a couple hours of time between consuming my last yeah. food, especially like I can do a protein drink, a milk, if you will, mm-hmm. um, which will support and pay for your, your good tattoo on your low back. But those are tasty. <clears throat> those are way tasty. Okay, I could take that comment in a few different directions because we're the but tattoo. We're, or the- <laughs> <laughs> but milk ones are good. But yeah. so I can. So I trained last night. There's my wife teaches an evening class and schedule dependent. I'll go train. I sleep less uh, restoratively when I train at night because it's an yes. endocrine system tax. Yep. But again, so I'm trying to attack this from a metric based mm-hmm. approach. So if I can back my food off. Two to three hours from when I go to bed, and I can not- Seven, eight, something around there. Yeah, I usually yep. try to eat my last meal, or food, not necessarily a meal, but like around seven ish, seven or eight at the latest. Mm-hmm. No phone in my hand for the last 60 to 90 minutes reading a book before I go to bed. The metric, like the sleep, it's yep. interesting, right? You can fuck with these levers. I've been working on hydration more. Yep. And so I'm taking all these supplements on top of just the TRT. I don't know which one I can point at and say, this is doing this and this is doing that. I definitely am feeling better. Yep. But then most people I talk to, they say it will be somewhere between two to four months before the results of TRT actually set in anyway. I'm not an expert on it. I don't Mm. know. 
Yeah. I, but it's I, hard to be like, yes, this one thing. Like, I haven't missed a single pill since I started because I'm all I'm looking at this as is scientific like, experiment. Scientific experiment, and I want to fucking optimize whatever yes. amount of time that I have left. That's all I care about. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, you're doing all the right stuff. I'm, I'm doing v so close to that. Um, but I agree with you. You, you. you will continue to have better and better and better results. Yeah. I would think the TRT, you should be feeling – you should be feeling it around now. I would think. What do you I mean, do? One cc a, a week, two hundred milligrams, something like that. The two on an insulin needle, dude. I don't know. What an <laughs> insulin needle is teeny tiny, but yeah. Have you ever? Uh, it, it sounds like you probably haven't. But uh, a BPC one five seven, the peptide, you probably. Um, I have heard of that. I've heard of the peptides. They did not prescribe me that. Right. They had talked about you know, and that, again, that would probably help your recovery post-surgery a lot and i'm not a doctor my recovery is going faster than i thought it was yeah gonna go. i saw you today i was like dude i've been training now for the last two weeks doing jiu-jitsu and i'll be honest i'm actually already beyond where i was before i got hurt i think i was dealing with a lot of inflammation in my stomach i sure. think that i had that kink issue in my intestines yeah i think it was impacting the way i was digesting food and absorbing mm -hmm. the nutrients and minerals there was like uh i would get a like almost a bloating or an acid reflux sensation like all of that shit is gone Makes so I think I think it had been there for a while. So, and again, like my D three was, mm -hmm. it might as well have been zero. It was right. so low. Yeah, which is I didn't realize the power of that regulatory. Oh my gosh! Yeah. So I don't fucking know which one yeah. is working for me at this point. All I can say is I am feeling better. I am sleeping better, but I'm also focusing mm -hmm. religiously on those things. Sure. So too too early to tell is yeah. all I can say. What what you what I've found is in those scenarios. Um, when you run out or whatever and you get off, you know, or get lazy. And I've had, I mean, I've been on basically the same protocol you have for like seven or eight years. Yeah. And so then when you get off something, you don't have your whatever, that's when you could tell. And yeah. even like my, my multivitamin I take, uh, I take thorn, I take the AMs and the PMs. Yep. I, t I take usually GABA at night as well uh, with my magnesium, mm -hmm. but I've had to, you know, I'm supposed to take three and three and then, you know, they're, they're coming down to the end. So I'll, I'll go down to two and two, try to ration them a bit before I get another order in. Uh, do they, do you have to make an order or do they send it to you? Uh, my assistant does orders for me. She, she has it like on. We don't all fucking have assistants, Bert, you know, you're looking at <laughs> Well, I'm assistant. also sponsored by Thorne now. Okay. That's good though. Yeah, it is. But I bought from them retail for so long and then we did a deal with yeah. them. And so, so yeah. <laughs> well, so in we, full disclosure, Merrick is sponsoring my treatment because I Perfect. told them I'm not interested in doing it unless I can talk about it openly. Yeah. And they said, if you're going to talk about it openly and also it's like probably like four to $600 worth a month. Yeah. You know I mean, like, sure. I exactly. Like, it's well worth it. I just told them if I'm going to do this because I, I mean, at 46 years old, I yep. don't know how much sand is left on the top of the hourglass versus the bottom, but I want to make the most out of it. Yep. Like there's absolutely no way I'm going to try to do something like this and pretend that I'm not trying to optimize everything. That to me is like the worst type of snake oil salesman. I a hundred percent agree. That is at about 40. I just kind of went, you know what? Like I want to be a badass 40. Like I I'm in the performance world. I'm not saying juice up, but it's yeah. like, I'm in the performance world. Everything else I do, I try to ring out the last RPMs or feet per second or whatever yeah, sure. it is. It's like, why am I not really looking at this? So I looked at, looked at my test and that the good part is, is when I was training and not taking anything, I had all my test numbers also. That's one thing I didn't have. Yeah. So I don't know where I would have been earlier in my life. But when a high school teenage woman has more testosterone <laughs> flowing through their body right. than I did, I'm going to try to do something about it. Sure. That. I knew around 1,000, which they said the high end is about 1,200. Yeah. 1,000, I felt great. And that's that was 30 years old clean training my ass off da, da, so it's like i just told doc i said i go i go to uh, eric serrano out of mm -hmm. um out of uh ohio and he's he's an amazing but it's like hey i want to be here so like we we came up with a plan like here's how we could safely do yeah. this and and the whole i agree totally with the whole optimization now you know i was talking about my buddy um uh alex oliver over yep. there virginia high performance and i know they specialize in kind of that holistic approach there with their program, like with the sleep and the the whole deal. You have to do all of that. You have to do it. And I think when he was, they were setting up um, the HP, the human performance program at the command back in the day, he said the goal was for them to pick up 1%. 
He said, that's all they were attempting to do. Yeah. And I mean, you're from that world, so you knew how all that worked. But when, when they started digging into all that, it was, if we can inc- improve performance by 1% or then the goal became like, if we could pick a 1% for each of these. Yeah. And they, they generally, from what he was telling me, they found out sleep was the key to the whole thing. Well, I would agree. Um, I do okay for short bursts on like interrupted sleep, but I'll mm-hmm. auger in at some point. Mm-hmm. But if you think about it too, it's one of the few things you have a lot of control over. And I, and I get the struggles of life and sure. You know, moms right now are like, <laughs> fuck you. I don't get to pick when I sleep. Yeah, I'm yeah, not, I get yeah, that. Right. Yeah. For most people, you could go to bed earlier. You know yes. what I mean? You could structure your life yes. around that. For me, it's one of the main things. It's the first thing I look yep. at in the morning when I wake up, I'm looking at sleep quality. Mm hmm. All and and then I wanted to get the uh, chest strap to wear during jujitsu because otherwise I have to take my watch off. I'm like, well, this is a chunk of data that I can't fuck with. Big chunk of data. Yeah, like yeah. what was my exertion? The number, the caloric burn is off. Mm-hmm. Whoever, I think this is a garment. You guys need to unfuck yourself when it comes to caloric burn and exercise. Like some right. of the numbers, I'm like, well, I guess I could go eat seven double hamburger. You know, like <laughs> no, with with a side of shakes. And like right. that's not the case. Right. But I wanted all that data yes. so I could start stereo equalizing all that yes. shit. It's yeah. been I, interesting. Yeah, I used to do the pulse oximeter and the the little pulse piece, you know, on the on the finger. Yeah, I was doing that for a while. Every morning I'd wake up before my heart rate got going. I would t- so yeah, in a way, kind of doing like an aura ring or whatever. Yeah. But but getting the oxygen uptake was really cool. And and I know you've you've hunted up at the Deseret before. I have. Um, you know, I'm from 250 feet. You're from at least 3,000. So oh yeah, it's like 48 up there. Uh, if not more, I thought it was like seven ish from what I thought I could be wrong. I'm such an athlete. I didn't really feel it, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, we're sealed. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> but the wild part was for me, the first day, kind of like you're saying, yeah. was okay. Second day. Well, one day we did 17 and a half miles. So they just, that's going to, that's going to move metrics around. They kind of screwed with me a little bit. They, yeah. they put me with Sir walks a lot as they called him. And they're like, let's just see what we could do. So 40,000 steps later over deadfall was just not yeah. what I was off. You can for. always shoot the guide there too. You can. That's <laughs> <laughs> that is smart. So, but what I did every day, I was watching what my my resting heart rate. Oh, uh, probably was going was, up and up and up. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Like I was in the high nineties at ten o'clock at night, laying in my bed. Yeah, your and body's my, just working harder with that. Oh center. man! And then the uh, my um, my pulse oximeter dropped to ninety one. For what I understood, they give you oxygen around that. When I was in the hospital, it would alert if I went below. I think ninety six. Yeah. So I was 91 hanging out in my bed. But the interesting it at Wednesday, I had the lowest pulse oximeter, the highest, highest pulse. And then it started tapering off because yeah. I had an accommodation effect by Friday. It was semi good. But the interesting part when I got back home, uh, I had a 10 percent drop in my resting heart rate after one week at altitude Extra training. blood cells, yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. So you walk, I walked off the plane in Atlanta like freaking T2. I amazing. love nerdy shit like that, though. It was great. Yeah. And so I was taking videos because I knew I'd forget. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, holy shit, like, I'm tacking I don't know if I out. like it that much, nerd, all right? But like, well, because I'll forget the numbers. Alert. <laughs> I, I took off my <laughs> my glasses. My, my, my pocket protector was great. Yeah. So I'm sitting in my room like a weirdo. But uh, I just I just love figuring that stuff out. So. And... I'm fascinated by the, I mean, how cool is it that you can be your own, not that I think people should like experiment, but mm-hmm. that you can be your own scientific laboratory. Of course. I mean, if you want to experiment, go fucking experiment. I'm just yeah. saying to me, I want to do it inside of some controls. Sure. Sure. But no, that that's, and actually it's funny that you use the term experiment. That's the term I've used when I, when I talk to, to my wife or whatever, like I've kind of realized I'm a scientist a shitty one but a scientist in a way i I see most of life based on hypothesis but the the compulsion to have to run the experiment meaning i'll i'll be half asleep thinking of some movement that the body will do and i'll like okay if that is it that movement and that angle it'll load this muscle or load this movement and that's so that's my hypothesis but I have to get data points and I have to run the experiment. Hence, I will go to the shop that day and go in the back and I'll screw around and bug my head designer until we build a prototype because I have to know if it works. Yeah. And But I started looking at it, whether it's that, whether it's driving down the road at 80 miles an hour, and I'll, I'll, I'll look in the back of every field and every power line. And my wife's like, what are you looking at? And we first started you know, hanging out. And I was like, I'm looking for deer. Yeah. And she's like, 
every one of them ever you're not you don't even hunt this state and i'm like yeah but i'm taking maybe it in. maybe i will one day maybe i will and i'm taking in intel like now i know when the topography drops off that's i'm, I'm gathering intel all the time and then but now I have to run the experiment. I have to know if I was right. I have to know if I walk into a field that I've never seen before based on the previous knowledge that I have. If I go over there and do this, then this, at this time of year, I got to know if I was right. And and so I've just started calling that. I just got to run the experiment. And so yeah, when I fair. when I get up in the morning and hunt, she's like, you just got to know, don't you? And I said, I just got to know. And I have I have a like a, a dock light that I put. Um, it sits in eight feet of water submerged off the end of my dock at, at home. And it lights about a 10 yard square area. And so it brings in the bait fish and the big fish come in and every night I walk out a binocular down there. I see what's on there. She's like, every night you're going to look, I go every night. I got to know because one day I told her, I said, one day a school of giant striped bass are going to come through there and I'm going to catch a fish of a lifetime. And I said, I'm going to check every day. And she's like every day. Really? I said, I can appreciate it. Just watch. Because one day it'll happen. Tism presents itself in many forms. <laughs> you might have a touch, and that's okay. Many hey, people do. It, you know, but it, it, I don't know. I, I just believe again goes back to I am not one yet. Yeah. Don't die today. What do you uh, in all the ups and downs you've had in your business? What have you What have you changed about your business model the most, or what What do you think are the most important lessons you've learned? Released. Um, release control of things that I'm not good at, and hire those skills outsource your weaknesses 100% because I think the man inside of us wants to you know you know hunt weakness and get all your you know get better all the stuff you suck at and I think you only have so many so much bandwidth so much time in the day and I've realized that I could do better for the team maximizing my strengths things that I already have gifting that I could do generally better than anyone on my team maximizing and spending more of my time doing that and the things I'm absolutely horrible at or have zero passion for. And if I have zero passion, I'm probably not going to get good at it in real time enough that we could actually be utilized and I could hire someone for that. And when I release that ego piece of it, that's when we, that's when we shot up because then I could, if, you know, if you're a shooter, stay on the gun. Yeah. You know, at all the stuff you guys have done in the 40 plus years, what's the coolest thing that you look back that you were involved in? You never would have thought would have happened. I mean, probably the biggest thing, two, two things. One is a metric thing, like the new ACFT test uh, for the Army. Combat, or what is it? Army Combat Fitness Test? Correct. Pull that right out of my ass. <laughs> you didn't even Google that. No. <laughs> Some military, like it's a different language and you can kind of figure that yeah, stuff out like, depending yeah, no, on the no, branch. No, no. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So we, we designed and, and fulfilled the at least 50% of the order for that, which was the largest purchase in military history of weightlifting equipment. So that oh, yeah. was... It was super cool, but it was also like what we had to do to fulfill that. We had to wildly gamble on ourselves because there was not enough inch and a half steel tubing on the planet to fulfill the order. So we had to order six months ahead of even putting in the bid. So it was one of those crazy eyes. That's a big moves. PO. Yeah, it was millions of dollars worth of steel that if we didn't get the order, now what? I would off the top of my head, I would say dildos. <laughs> Perfect. Inch and a half. Temperature per- regulating. That's what I'm saying. I mean, <laughs> yeah. but it was like stuff like that. Like we had to restand up. It had to be all American made. So we had to, to, to re we stood up our own company that made in a factory that made bumpers secretly, uh, in America. Um, we started back up a hundred year old, uh, measuring tape company to make 18,500 measuring tapes for the military. We, I mean, just like all this crazy stuff, but we had to do it in six months. And so that was like that we got it and got it all in and all the stuff worked and we didn't have any, you know, stuff come back and whatever. And it went all over the world. Like that's that from a singular event was something that's kind of like, okay, this is impossible, but we were able to pull it off. Probably the invention of the rig system is probably the thing I would say, you know, kind of like before racks had holes on all four sides and they were infinitely modular, Mm -hmm. like to know I drew that up on a napkin in 2007. And that was something that like every company has now is kind of neat to know, like that's awesome to go like, okay, there's a before this and after this, this, that we, the goal was always to change the strength industry and be, or to be relevant within the strength industry and to know that something we did legitimately changed the course of the strength industry is pretty cool. 
that's something even if we if we could today we're like okay we'll see fingerprints of that design characteristic for probably a long time yeah so who do you think you'll pass the torch to one day boy i don't know you have kids i have three so my daughter is 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 she's the most headstrong. So I've thought you know she would probably be the one. My uh, my oldest son is just like, just super cool and fun and whatever. I would think he'll probably be like if if they're all in it, he'll be like my top salesman because everyone loves him. <laughs> <laughs> she will be my middle daughter. Will be the hard ass like. And you know, and she'll be like the COO, just cracking nuts, just cracking heads. nuts, just like she does to her brother, right? Yep. And then my my youngest son, Kodiak, is just like super sweet, but a big outdoors guy, and he'll he'd probably run Sornex outdoors, or he'll be like a guide, he'll be like a duck guide, or yep. so, like he'll be like a Cole Kramer, like that's kind of who. But as far as running the whole thing, I don't know, man. I don't know. So I got to stick around long enough to see what happens. I'd love to make it like a, a third generation business, but who yeah. knows, right? Yeah. You also don't want to force that though, either. Correct. That's the thing. It's like, I kind of mentioned that and they all kind of look at me like, but they're like little kids. So yeah, they, I was going to say, they mentioned that now. Give them time. Yeah. I, might, I remember my dad mentioning it and I didn't really have a real want for it until I was probably midway through college. There's also such a legacy piece there. That, uh, there how old are your kids? Uh, it's almost eight, almost 10 and just turned 12. There's a legacy piece there that they won't understand for a bit. Correct. Like, the, you know what I mean? The That's family what name. Yeah, yeah. It's going to take some time. Yeah. Cause I didn't, I didn't either. You know, I wanted to go to college because I'd watched too many eighties movies and I wanted to do all the fun stuff that they did in the eighties. Yeah. I was just like, Oh, it's awesome. And I, I wanted to go be a fly fishing guide, a hunting guide, grow a beard and be dirty all the time and just live in the mountains. When was the last time you shaved? 10 years ago, something like that. Not that you should shave your beard, but I bet you would freak the fuck out of your kids if you did. Oh, yeah. Two of them have never <laughs> seen me shave. That's what I'm ever. saying. Yeah. You could break sure. into your own house and see how they'd respond to an intruder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and Dudley and I were talking about it's like my, if I ever have to hit witness protection program. It's simple. It'd take about five minutes. Five minutes. I'd bleach my hair blonde yep. and freaking go shave. And, and I'm Venezuelan tomorrow. Or whatever. I so, like it. Yeah. So I don't know. It, it was kind of as a, it was actually when my daughter, I had, I had grown a big handlebar mustache and then I'd shaved it and then I was going to grow it again because I was like doing a thing at the Arnold Classic. I was like, I'll do that. But I wanted to shave, have a beard and then cut it into a mustache like one day. So I didn't have like the weird stage. Yeah. And then my wife got pregnant with my, my daughter and it was the same time as the Arnold. So I couldn't go that year. And then you know how it is when you have kids, you don't know where you are for months. Yeah. And then you look up and there's like, oh, I have this really gnarly beard because I haven't shaved in a year because I haven't looked in the mirror. I don't really have that issue. I look like I could go undercover in like an Amish community, you know, like churning butter or like making like rocking chairs. Yeah. I you like know. that though. That's Have a, you seen the God damn it? What's the movie with Woody Harrelson where he's the boy? Yeah, 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 yeah. That was a great. Kingpin. Movie. Have you seen King that you. one, Michael? Okay. I just milked the cow. It took me a little bit to get her started. I was like, sir, we have a bull. <laughs> <laughs> so what? God. What? What would? What would be your move if you had to go underground? I rem You know what? Like before I ever, physically before, before I well you know before I ever met you I watched that show that you were on which is actually pretty cool which you, one uh, where you the, the guy tries to go on the lamb and you find oh him. hunted the TV show is that on? was actually a pretty fun Dog show shit. Uh, it was a fun show to watch yeah but what people need to understand is reality TV is anything but reality and let's just leave wait it wait wait you mean to tell me. Let's just say that entire show was based off of the hours that the cameramen could work based off their union scale. <clears throat> so yeah. are you really on the run when you like have six hours? You know, yeah. there's, there's a whole yeah. component. Of but that. I did enjoy that you were able to catch him, whether that was false or not. Who knows? Hard to say. <clears throat> How hard would it be actually to go on the run and not be found? You would have to ditch all of your electronics. That would be step number one. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what I've thought. If you could do that. I mean, and that includes like access to bank accounts, ATM, like all of those things. Your vehicle that has oh, yeah. GPS. If it's a modern vehicle. Stuff, yeah. I mean, you could always. <laughs> Everything I'm about to say is a hypothetical. I'm not giving no, anybody no. any advice for anything. I mean, you could always steal another vehicle, right? No. So, the, I mean, the telemetry on your vehicle can, of course, be tracked. But if you were able to get uh, in vehicles that are not necessarily directly associated with you, that's an option. Um, I mean, what, what year vehicles prior to, that's a good question. Mid nineties. It would be uh, to be safe. I would go with anything 
before the modern implementation of like the screen in the middle. Yeah. With GPS data. Sure. <clears throat> um, it would be, it would physically not be that hard. Mm-hmm. It would logistically be pretty challenging. Sure. And you might, depending, I mean, like, again, depending on the type of scenario, you might have to push up against some of your moral boundaries. You Good might have to steal. That. You know sure. what I mean? Like, if you don't have any money and you need sure. food and shelter and all those things, you know, there's there's ways to morally and ethically get mm-hmm. those things. And there are ways where you could get them quicker that may bounce up against your personal moral and ethics. Yep. I guess it would depend on the forest fire that's chasing you, you know. But the biggest thing that's is- That's an it, eloquent way to put that. You know, it, it the, what, the electronics is what would trip- yeah. Most people up because you truly would have to you in a digital world that we live in. If you want to disappear from people who have the ability to see not only the front end, but the back end of that and track them in real time, you'd have to shit can them. Just all of it. Every single bit. Yeah. And you would have to have, you know, stupid as it sounds, obviously you, you any of your GPS, like even, even, I don't know if they can track, I would assume that they could, I have no inside information on this. GPS, a GPS receiver, I don't think, has two-way communication. But like an in-reach, I bet you they could track that, mm-hmm. right? Because that is communicating mm-hmm. back and forth. It's being interrogated. I don't know. I would I would avoid anything with batteries mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that are directly associated with you. Again, mm-hmm. that's not to say you couldn't get another device. Right. Right? But then if they were able to identify that that leap had been made and then, yeah. you know what I mean? Like that's the... Sure. Not impossible. Yeah. I mean... It's it's not on the the horizon for me at any any bit. Uh, as far as you know, what do you far. think is outside of that door right now? It's go time. <laughs> Jocko with the tattoo gun <laughs> and a stencil that says "good." <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I just always thought it was interesting. I, and of course, I play these scenarios out after. Yeah, I think they're good for people to think about. I think mm-hmm. burying a school bus in your property so you have an indoor like bunker maybe that's that's a bit too far. But like, also live your life. I don't like to tell people what to do. I'm much rather to have conversations about, hey, maybe we should be thinking about these things yep. as opposed to being very directive and like, this is what you should do. Sure. Hard pass. Yeah. Yeah. Just I, you know, having the redundancy of systems and like, okay, well, things get really wrong, really bad. Like, don't have to go to work. I do have to eat and have to drink yeah. and have to have shelter. So, Michael, if your phone were to stop working and you needed to navigate from A to B, how would you do it? If I gave you an address, how would you find it? So an address like in Cal- it's, like, <laughs> it's a number system uh-huh. with a word. It's it's wild. Oh, no, I mean okay. somewhere else. Have you ever navigated your way somewhere via a non electronic means? Um I've used a map on a phone. Did you hear the question? <laughs> So theoretically, I could use a map that's not on a phone. <laughs> Okay. But how would I do that? Yeah. Oh, I mean. I'm going to lay out a scenario for you that you're going to find hard to believe that has occurred in Bert and I's lifetime. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) There were books, and I mean thick books, that were like. Heavy. Number, letter. And you could like go into the back, into the index, and find like the street name, which would tell you which page it was on. And it'd be like eight hotel. And you'd converge on the two, and you'd be like flipping back and forth from pages. Oh, yeah. I've seen those. <clears throat> you've yeah. never seen one of those in your. I know you've seen books, I, I hope. <laughs> no. But imagine doing a cross country trip with that's your primary source of navigation. That was how I used to do sales calls. I had yeah. Atlas in the. Uh, Passenger seat and my Rolodex, my yeah. literal Rolodex. I'd be pulling. You have no idea. Yeah. Where ba- I mean, basically, Bert and I like you've heard of Christopher Columbus, right? Right. The Oregon <laughs> that Trail. Was us. I do know. Oh, yeah. wow, he died wow. of dysentery yeah. one time. <laughs> basically, Christopher Christopher Columbus and Bert and I <laughs> mm-hmm. did the same thing. Yeah, exact same thing. Yeah, yeah. Essentially. And the Vikings as well. Yeah. We just yeah. didn't have a sextant. We used a compass mm-hmm. or the long rope behind the boat. Yeah, that's what the Vikings used, right? With the knots in it, probably. Yeah. Yeah, that's why they would call it you going. You know what worries me though? Like, I ask him if he's ever used a map on a non-electronic medium. He goes, "Yeah, on my yeah, phone." Yeah, on my phone. Like, so one, there's a listening retention and comprehension <laughs> issue that I worry about. But <laughs> the smartest thing that any, you know, <laughs> he literally answered the question that I asked him as if he hadn't listened to it in real time, which I deeply appreciate. He fits right in. Um, 
I mean, a smart enemy would just shut electronics down. People would fucking auger in. Yeah, there's a part. I shouldn't say that. Remember when social media went down like a year or two ago? No. So it was like how long was it down for? Like seven minutes? Because that would be like uh, it was a like Defcon four hours. Five. Remember that when, in, no, when I don't Facebook that. and Instagram like? How long do you remember out. that? It was a it was a virus, I think. My marketing and media team were freaking out. I was dancing in my office. I was like, "We're free! It's the '90s again!" <laughs> I was so pumped. I was like, "I don't have to f with this anymore. Yeah. I don't have to create content. I don't have to tell anyone what I'm doing. I don't have to see whatever." And they were like, "It's back on." I'm like, <sighs> and then I just tried to pretend. I pretended for the rest of the day that it wasn't because I was like, "Man, I'm going to go listen to some Soundgarden, some <laughs> Alice in Chains. It's going to be 1990s again. It's going to be great." Have you heard of either of those bands? Man, it was. Soundgarden and Alice. Yeah, I like Soundgarden. I don't really listen to Alice in Chains. Yeah, but it, it, it's cool or interesting that the music mm, passes over. Yeah, but many other but things no skill like, sets, no skill sets <laughs> or knowledge of like the older movies. Probably, well, probably because music is an easier medium. You could you could yeah. encounter that while you're driving or something. And they and lines. they use them on commercials now. Yeah, they try to sell cars. They use. I'm old. talking stacks, Michael, of of map books. Oh yeah. Seems very space inefficient. Then there was MapQuest. Oh, man. And then you printed it out. Which you printed out and um, then would flip through the pages uh -huh. as... Imagine just going from like San Diego to LA and it was six pages of directions. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then you had to, like, if you tried to save paper, you would print it on both sides and they'd bleed through <laughs> and you had no idea what was going on. Christopher it's, Columbus. It's, it's yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> it's I prefer great. my phone. It's, it's possible that what we did was harder than what Christopher Columbus did. That makes the most sense. I think so. That makes the most. I mean, we were on roads, which I guess we didn't could have, have any made it indigenous easier. Indigenous people to go up against, nor giant viruses. I would say, I'm going to call it samesies. <laughs> samesies, <laughs> totally samesies. <laughs> Where's my holiday? God, tell me about uh, Winter Strong. It looks like it just went down. Yeah, yeah, it just went down. Still have a little Winter Strong hangover. You got to come sometime. Well, I don't go to things I'm not invited to. That's a hard and fast principle. All right, you know what I mean. Hmm. I like that. That's yeah. a good principle. It is. Well, it was a. It was a part of. A, there was like three other things. It was like, don't go to things you're not invited to. And then there was two other ones I can't remember. But those were both good too. <laughs> 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 nice. No, it's like if they don't care enough to invite you. No, that wasn't. I don't fucking know. The one I remember is don't go to things you're not invited to. Right, where well, you're super invited. Okay. I will definitely invite you, and I would like to invite you to come to Summer Strong sometime. I'm going to assume that that occurs on the other side of the calendar. Mm. Well, you are sharp, aren't you? <laughs> It'd be weird if it was in spring. <laughs> yeah, we just screw with everybody. It's the week before Winter Strong, yeah, just to mess like with everybody. Groundhog Day. Yeah. So we did actually Summer Strong. We, we're on our 17th year. Um, Is it like a festival, essentially? Uh, it's kind of weird. So it started as my dad's birthday. So his is in the summer. And I was like, hey, Pops, what do you want to do for your birthday? He's like, hey, let's open up the gym this weekend. Invite people over. Let's cook. Let's eat, drink, and just like everyone could lift, like open gym day. So people showed up first year, 38 people from five mm -hmm. different states, and we all – but what we saw eventually happen like really, really quickly, someone who was into, say, sandbag training would start sandbag training. And the people then oh, Olympic lifting and powerlifting, they would like kind of do his thing. So the it was kind of like – transfer stuff. Knowledge transfer. <clears throat> so we just watched it happen organically. It was like, God, this is really cool. So next year we did it. And then a couple years into it, like, well, let's have like specific speakers that will – go into different pieces and parts. And then it's just kind of evolved into that. Also, if you took like a seminar, mixed it with a TED talk, because mm -hmm. you'll have some people that are just really, really interesting talking about just things, anything in the human performance world, some of the best knife makers in the world. Yeah, Josh the has been there a bunch of times. Yeah, uh, Josh has been to Winter Strong a bunch. He hasn't been to Summer Strong. So Neil, Com Neil Kamimura, do you follow Neil? I don't think so. RPM Neil on uh, Instagram, wild. I mean, probably the, one of the best presentations of all time. Just crazy. You got to check it out. But it, it just kind of turns into knowledge transfer, all different levels, with a little bit of family reunion, a little bit of group therapy. It's community. Community, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's that. So six, seven years ago, 
there's a group of, of us that like, that's the thing we look forward to all year is, is summer strong. Right. And they're like, we got to do it more often. Like, you know, it's like we ought to do a winter strong. It's like, yeah. And then everyone kind of wanted the same exact thing, but in the winter, mm-hmm. just so we could get together more often. So I kind of threw a little bit of a wrinkle in it because I was doing so much outdoors and hunting. I was like, well, I started thinking about it. It's like, we have a farm, uh, the Sorenex, we have, we have a farm that's out by where we are. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so we were doing stuff developing out there and I was like, okay, who, what are the two things I really, really get into? It's like the outdoors strength conditioning, you know, kind of right back to the old early days of Richard Soren. And then you start like looking at the people in your phone, like every one of my cool friends in my phone are into one of the two things. Yeah. There's a huge Venn diagram overlap. Correct. And then I started thinking, well, gosh, there's so many people strength and conditioning world that grew up on a field in an urban or a suburban area because they've been sports, they've, they've grown up in a gym, but they don't have time or maybe not been exposed to the outdoor world. And then there's a bunch of people in the outdoor world that may know a little bit about training or the things they think they know about training are like really, really rudimentary compared to the people that are doing it every day, kind of at the developmental level. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, man, these two groups of people should know each other. So Winter Strong was just, I'm going to take the two coolest groups of people. I'm going to smash them together and do an event in my farm. So we'll stay out there two days. It's like an immersion event. Everyone camps out. There's cooking. There's all kinds of like a giant hunt camp. And um, so there's classes on both parts and pieces of, of those puzzles. Like this year we had. Uh, We had cyber scouting, we had trapping, we had stand set up and selection, we had fishing, um, we had two or three different types of cooking, rifles, pistols, um, precision stuff, we had exercise, we had competition, like all kinds of different. That's sweet, man. It was was awesome. And so, and and it's a community effort. I mean, this year we had 250-something people. People just camp out there? Camp out, yeah. Sweet. So it's pretty cool when you get, you know, and hopefully this year the weather was a little too nice, but sometimes you get just shitty, shitty weather. And so, there, I mean, there was guys that had been there, played in the NFL, coached all over the world, and the first year, like, 48-year-old man is like, I've never slept outside in a tent my entire life. And you're like, oh, right, you were busy being a high-caliber athlete your whole life, and so you don't know what it's like to sleep in the cold. Yeah. And so when it's really neat when you get someone, a Cole Kramer or somebody like that, like, hey, <laughs> bless you. I'll lean into you and I'll mentor you on this. And then that guy's like, Hey, I'll mentor you on this. And so that's kind of how that works. So we just got done with that. Uh, our sixth year of some of winter strong was this past week. And it was awesome. You got to come. That's okay. Good. And I'd love to actually have you speak at summer strong sometime. If you'd be interested. What do you want me to talk about? Boy, you, you, you've done a lot of stuff. I don't know. We'd have to talk about it. I don't it. know if this, the stuff I've done is really applicable to people's lives. I've done some dumb shit. Well, I mean, being a seal is not easy. You've it's not hard. started <laughs> you've started businesses, you've squirrel suited around the world. Also not hard and there is a low intelligence requirement for that. Mm. Mhm. Well, that's you fit right in. Yeah. So, I don't know. We talk about it. I can chat. Sure. I mean, <clears throat> I'm open to it. Yeah. So, that's those are the the two strongs, winter strong, summer strong. And so, yeah, we just had that and uh it was it was Super cool. We did a competition very similar to the SIG Hunter games that we did. So we did it, but with more, not just shooting the whole time. It was archery, pistol, rifle, uh, physical fitness, fishing, fire making, medical. That's so pretty you, robust. It was pretty robust for a two and a half hour deal. So did you, Cole tell you he was the guide to my SIG Hunter game oh, I know. team? Did he tell you why we lost? Because I beat y'all? No. Why is that? Because I just had to get that shit. one in. <laughs> Ask him who shot, from a percentage perspective, the lowest on our team. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm not going to name any names. You're not, gonna... but it was Cole Kramer. <laughs> but it was Cole Kramer, Alaskan yeah. guide. He was our guide. Really? Maybe he's just good at seeing the animals. I don't know. I wasn't there. Yeah. Well, I was there, but not on your team. Yeah, that's right. You guys did win. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cheating has its rewards. Well, I, I left with a lot less hundreds in my pocket than I came with. <laughs> Yeah. No, we had actually a badass team. Like I was shocked. That event was cool. That event was way cool. It was right on the edge though of like, hey, this weather is unacceptable. Way unacceptable. <laughs> I hear I heard your tent break in the middle of the night. And I yeah, was like, it did. I was just like, fuck, I'm driving into town. I don't care. Mine mine landed on my face 
and it was like I had a split second. I don't know why to I bounce it. Yeah, my pole snapped and went through the fabric of the tent, uh, so yeah, I never had screwed. the opportunity. Yeah, my land, and I just went bah, and then yeah. I was like, huh, and then I set an alarm like every hour to go off and knock this, knock the snow yeah. off. Yeah, that was. I was like, just like, fuck this. Yeah, I remember hearing you walking around. And I was like, oh, that sucks. It did. Suck. And I think Brent Burns and a couple other guys got blown out too. It is uh, what it is. That was a that was a difficult um, thing for me. Like that uh, that elevation kicked my butt. Yeah, and that was you know I didn't prefer waking up in three feet of snow either when it was ninety degrees. The, the, uh, three I don't know inches if I ever three preferred inches. to wake up in three feet of snow. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> was, that was a fun event, but that's kind of how we set up the. Um, the the competition this year, but it was cool. We had like guys, you know, you had to cast into this thing, and that just ate people alive. Oh, like, I bet. Well, you combine all those skill sets again. It goes back to, you know, what is hard about buds? If you're good at one thing, you're mm-hmm. going to get challenged with yep. something else. That's what I like about events like that. Yeah, you can't. I guess you could be kind of a jack of all trades, but you're still going to have something you're better at than, than yeah. others. Yeah. The cool part <laughs> was is the the team that won. Um, the team captain was an 18 year old kid. It had this his second. Uh, the, the two guys that were there were two 18 year old kids, but the neat part was are the two kids I've been mentoring since they were 10, and they've been at Winter Strong every year and learned all this stuff. And and <laughs> they, they call just, those ringers. Well, the the thing was just like, hey, this the point we're teaching. If you didn't show up at the classes, you don't know the stuff. And they knowledge had, is knowledge, man. They had 60 year old guys on their team that pulled two hamstrings and they still pulled out the win. And those two dudes were beasts. Yeah. But it was just like, oh, yeah, the kids, they're just doing it all the time, doing bow drills. They're just smoking through it. And you're like, oh, you took the class five years straight. Hey, paid off. So, I mean, they all won like a Volkortsen rifle. They won all, all kinds of cool stuff. That's awesome, man. Yeah. It was, it was neat to see, to see like, see it work, right? What are you the most fired up or excited about now, Sornex wise? I don't give me any like trade secrets, obviously, but you have something on the um, horizon. Yeah, actually, we have a new product coming out with Sornex Outdoors. We finally have like a product. Sornex Outdoors was more just a passion, and uh, I wouldn't call it marketing, but it was just more of a passion of mine. Mm-hmm. It was it was the how do I connect these two worlds? And so we finally made a thing where we launched it last week at Winter Scrum called Outfitter Rack. So it's basically going back to that Venn diagram. I was like, okay. Guys and girls like us, there's there's a, a physical component of strength conditioning. We all do it, even to some level. Some people love it. Some people just know they need to do it. Yeah. And usually all of us are in the outdoors. And then the last part of it is most of us are gear guys. I don't know if you're much of a gear guy as maybe some of your constituents. It's not a passion, but it's a hobby. <laughs> right, right, yeah. You, you have a bunch of boxes somewhere. I am not going to say whether or not it's healthy or unhealthy. Right, right. It, it exists. It, exi- it exists, <laughs> right? So, exactly. So, I, I thought about it, and I, I'm, I'm fortunate that I have a outbuilding with pallet yeah. racking, and you know, it, and I own a weightlifting equipment company, so I could have a little bit more robust scenario. Yeah. For your things. For my things, right? Because <laughs> I really like doing a set of squats and then walking over and mounting a scope at the same time or tweaking with a bow yeah. or packing for an elk hunt. And like, that's just the 90 second rest periods or whatever it is. I just find my idle, my busy hands. I like doing stuff. It's a great combination of activities too. Yeah. Yeah. So I try to build something that like, okay, a, a guy or a girl could purchase one thing they could train on. And it's also a storage system kind of like, I guess you're like gear lockers you had at work. Mm-hmm. So you have all of your stuff with movable pins and hooks that you could like load it all out however you want it. Yeah. So um, that's kind of what we we're launching right now. So I'm pumped about that, and I'm actually just interested because I've not done anything really B to C before to an extent, like most Somebody of our used stuff. That term the other day. What does that mean? Business to consumer. Okay, then they were saying B to G to. I'm assuming B to, business B to, to B. Well, B to G would be business to government. B yep. to B. So like business really, to business. Sornex is really more B to B, business to business. Okay. So although we sell plenty of stuff to individuals, that's not like our really our our driver of our business the majority of our money is made off of institutions yeah. you know colleges pro teams elite military organizations that type of stuff. like that's the majority of who we're built for like we could show up with 50 racks that are hyper customized that are exactly alike we're good at that you know selling a less expensive option garage to your garage is yeah. not really our what our focus is so this is like our first time like 
looking at that as a potential consumer and bi- building a business to consumer product. But I like it. The fun part of that was all it was is what would I get? That was the that was the metric. Would I think this is cool? Would I mess with this a lot? Would I would I and it has like a workstation on it so you could screw with your bow or your yeah. rifle or whatever and have all your little parts and pieces that move around. So I'm pumped about that because we're just pushing it out right now. I so, dig it, man. Yeah, that's thanks. so much better than just dealing with your shit in bags and boxes on the floor. Yeah, and and half of it, like you know, of course we grew up like the you know commando and 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 John Wick, and it's like he walks into a cool room and all your stuffs up and you could see it and mess with it. Yeah, and um, so John, I don't know. John, John, John Wick's not real though. You know, we should talk about. I that. thought you went through buds together. No, I went through buds with Jack Carr, who's also not real. It's a fake name. Yeah, he's actually getting one of those. Yeah, we're, we're putting one in his. You were just in, on his show, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, while yeah, a while ago. I okay. really like him. He's awesome. Like a really really cool guy. Yeah. Like one of my most favorite people to talk to because we just probably had the same ridiculous influences from. Yeah, movies. he's very good at articulating his influences too. Also, yes. a student of history. Yes, very much enjoy his his work. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. What so, else you got going on, man? You still are you do you play it all in the CrossFit space or did Rogue lock that up? Rogue pretty much locked that up. We were the first when it first started. Glassman used to order from me, uh and like he would just call me. He's like, Yeah, hey, you got my credit card, I'm gonna get this. I'm like, Okay, cool. Yeah. So we were those first games or two, and then you know, Rogue really dove heavily into that. And that yep. was that was kind of where I was talking about like you find a business that like figures out the game fast. Yeah. Like they they figured out the game fast. Yeah. And, and I was still like, hey, we do colleges, we do this, we do that. And like, you know, so it's kind of like, okay, that's that's what their business model is. Fine. We'll just make sure we're doing our business model. I think the best there's more than enough place. room on the table for that. I've known Bill and Katie for a long yeah, time. Sure. And one of their, I've been one of their ambassadors for a long time. They're fantastic. But yeah. at the same time, like there's enough room in the ecosystem for everybody. Exactly. And yeah. so like I, I, they do what they do well and, you know, we do what we do well. And so it's kind of like everyone's staying in their lanes kind of thing. I dig it. Yeah. What else, man? I want to get you, uh, I know you're up here visiting a friend. Yeah, well. no, shoot. It's been I'm, I'm, two I'm and a half some hours. Yeah, I'm here visiting you. This is Like I, right I, now, but like there's other people up here, you know, too. Yeah, yeah. Derek, you need to t- get Derek on the podcast. I feel like we're connected somehow, but. He, I know he comes down. He, he's actually about to become an officer here in town. Um, Sheriff or deputy? <sighs> Actually, that's the same thing. Yeah, sheriff. he's not going to be the sheriff. Okay. Not the sheriff, but there's. <laughs> I don't know the deputy. So it would be deputy. How does that work? I know the KPD, Kalispell Police Department, Flathead Valley Sheriff's Office. I thought it was maybe Flathead Valley. I so he'd be a sheriff then, <clears throat> not a sure yeah, a sheriff's I, deputy. I, yeah, I I don't know exactly. Um, but he and I competed against each other in college. Who used to win? <sighs> we battled back and forth. Contentious. It was. We were. We were. He was the West version of me, and I was the South version of him. Because our coaches, my coach left and 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 got him. Yeah. And then there was always this, you know. So he's lives up here full time, or is getting ready yeah. to? No, he lives. He's he lives a mile from where we're sitting right now. Up yeah, on. we got to figure that out. Yeah. Some way. Yeah. He he says he goes in the store all the time, but he's one of the most interesting people to talk to. Okay. Like you would very much enjoy. Um, but yeah, he was, you know, you know, have you ever heard of Charles Poliquin? Uh, yes, but you, I couldn't, if you ask me. Strength conditioning, kind of a weird <clears throat> guru. Okay. Did so, you write a book? Many. Okay. Yeah. So he was Charles's right hand man and went around internationally, like teaching all his classes for years and years. Then he was the, uh, personal trainer and somewhat mentor thing for the uh, princes of Saudi Arabia for seven or eight years, hmm. lived over there. And then I hooked him up with Zach Brown. So he was Zach's trainer for years. The musician. Mm-hmm. Sweet. And um, so he's just gone around and had this just wild world, seeing it from all over the world and just kind of traveling and just learning. But one of the smartest dudes, you know, I, I kind of like laugh. I was like talking to Derek is like eating candy, but it's medicine. Like it's always interesting, but you learn a lot. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm getting to, we're getting to hang out, which is pretty freaking cool for me. That's awesome, man. But yeah, you, I got to hook you guys up. Yeah, please um, do. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, right now, man, like Sornex Outdoors is crushing or, or starting to crush the regular. Well, where can people find it? Uh, that will be on SornexOutdoors.com. Okay. That will be a new page we're building out for that outfitter rack. Well, how about upstream from that? Just Sornex, yeah. I'm assuming it to be nested. Yeah, Sornex.com. And that's kind of, you know, we're still doing, um, 
you know, a lot of resident stuff too. Still, yeah. generally higher higher end stuff, which is fine. We're actually building uh, Jason Kelsey's home gym right now. Um, football player that just retired, um, but uh, his stuff is going to be pretty cool. And a couple other guys that um, you know, Brady and Mahomes and all those cats. Tom Brady, mm-hmm. yeah, it's a handsome man. Yeah, he's pretty good at football too. I mean, yeah. I, I guess I don't really check him out as much as the, but he is handsome. He's tall as fuck too. Seems that way. <clears throat> I never met him, but uh, hey, you know what was interesting? No. <laughs> <laughs> Your name came up. Oh God. Years ago, and I want to substantiate this. So th- during COVID, it's what three years ago. Yep. So Sturgill Simpson came out to the my farm, and Dudley and I were teaching him how to shoot archery. Okay. And he, we mentioned your name, and he said you two went through the Navy together. I think y'all start. Maybe you were on the same boat. Like first off, dick face. I've never been on a boat. All right, <laughs> <laughs> ship. We were in boot camp around the same time. Period. Okay, yeah. Because he said that he, because he, we mentioned your name, and he was like, like kind of. He didn't know that you're like your stature or rec- more recent past. And it was interesting. He was kind of like, "Whoa, I know that name!" Like it was, it was kind of like, "Hey, I went to middle school with this guy. Whatever happened to him?" Kind of. Yeah, thing, which I, I think we was passed through boot camp at around the same time. Mm-hmm. Dudley and I had tried to drive that one to ground. I don't know how detailed that we got, but yeah, it was weird. First off, don't ever talk about me again when I'm not there. You tell Dudley that too. All right, I'll make keep sure my name knows. out of your mouth. Or I'm going to Will Smith you. All right, <laughs> have fun with that. <laughs> It's true. I'm have to pull a firearm out for that one. <laughs> you I'll probably have, have one closer to him. You have no idea. <laughs> yeah, no, They're I don't. Everywhere. I'm mad that I don't have guns with me. <laughs> I got enough for both of us. Good, perfect. Let's go. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> uh, and where can people find you personally, man? Uh, they can socials. go to socials, Bert Soren, um, Sorenx Outdoors, Sorenx.com. We do Squattober if you've ever done the whole squat tober thing we write programming um, i don't do shit just because people do goofy stuff yeah with the month other than hunt in september and october that is a month i comply See, with you, you know <laughs> you know what you should do this year i know you can if you we did the shoot to eat challenge this year so tell me did, more okay so i had a, a target made there was yep. a vital size target yep and and so i kind of started thinking like you know when you're, you know, not being sports specific, but when you when you go shoot something with a with a bow, you generally have the first shot's the one that counts. It's not your fiftieth shot, right? You can be lucky if you get a second. Correct. <laughs> so what I started doing was I would wake up in the morning, drink a glass of water, walk outside, and cold bore shot one shot. Archery. Archery. Distance. Uh, well, the key of it is you start at whatever distance is relatively difficult. Dual- one yard. <laughs> one yard <laughs> relatively difficult but but doable challenging i.e you will miss if you screw it up yep but you if you make it you get breakfast you get coffee you get your whole thing you go on for the day if you don't you don't eat your next meal and it's not the biggest thing it's just a tax it's yeah. like okay this sucks it's, it's the a remi- consequence that's in the back of your mind and your yes. shot process yes but if you make it you add a yard the next day okay and so you're either getting better or you're or you're going hungry, and and it's every day for two weeks. I like it. And so I mean, you you know, you start at 50 yards. I mean, you're going to go up to 65 or whatever. 20. <laughs> yeah, but it was it was <laughs> awesome though. I mean, and then how we did it, we we posted it for like, sure. That was in your story. So then you have this the the societal pressure of like you're sending it, and you're like you walk up to it, and you're like son of a bitch. Yeah. And then everyone knows that you don't get food that day. And I had some guys that would fast an entire day to the next one. And I didn't tell them to do that. But they were like, no, I don't get to eat today. I'm like, bro. <laughs> I mean, some things can be taken just too far. Yeah, well, I, you know, I agree. But I, I will say I missed one this year. And you talk about being pissed off. <laughs> Holy crap. But focus the next. Do you shoot for lunch and dinner or are those guaranteed? Uh, no, I just I shoot just whatever whatever my next meal will be. Okay, but, but you talk about like b- breaking the cadence of your day. You're like, oh, so I just go to work now. I don't get breakfast. Yeah. I don't get coffee. I just I go take a. This sucks. Yeah, and then you're sitting there at lunch, just being mad and everything like that. But it's cool because it it creates a consequence. I like the consequence. Yeah. That's the hardest thing about either rifle, any type of marksmanship. Flat ranges are great. Yep, and flat range skill needs to be remembered that mm-hmm. it's flat range skill. Yes. 
you add an animal or an opponent, you can take your effective range and probably cut it in half. Right. That's about <laughs> that's about it. Yeah. Exactly. So the the next day I woke up and it was like hyper focus. <laughs> like it was because I re, I re, yo no seriously because I remember like you know you're you're letting the pen float a little yeah. bit and there's that little break of 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 you know of um oh my brain's been a long day of concentration and you might you know sometimes we're like it, it'll be good enough oh i know exactly what you're talking right about. you know where i'm that you're, yeah. you're like no i'm good and you break the <laughs> shot and you're watching it fly you're like i'm not oh, good i'm not good you like <laughs> just i want to rewind it because you as you're watching it fly right and just the the feeling of like now i've 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 been watched on online as being a failure i failed it was public failure. I have a, a hunger thing going on. No coffee. No coffee. This just sucks. Yeah, but, I like it. But it was uh, that was fun. Yeah, I'll send you. We made some stickers, and so I'll send you some of those this year I'm to in. shoot. It, it's a uh, it's a good one. I started at sixty last year, and I think my last shot was at seventy four, whatever. But you're like. You're getting up there. You're like, why did I start at sixty? Like this is. I start about five yards. Smart, it's yeah. smart, because you're you're like I gained the weight arrow during tip this at full draw. Maybe <laughs> brushing against the target. Like, I'm, getting, back, I'm getting, getting breakfast. Backups. Yeah, I'm getting breakfast and coffee. <laughs> nice, nice. All right, man. Well, yeah, I'll let man. you get out of here. Hey, Unless you got anything else? Yeah. Oh, no, just uh, shoot. No, it's. Uh, um, yeah, no, it's just I appreciate the opportunity. Appreciate yeah, us sure, getting man. to hang out. I know we've we've brushed. Uh, I know feel contact so many times. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, and I, I hope you enjoyed the joke that I did for years and introduced myself every time I saw you for a few years. No, oh, I know. Which, which I, yeah, I, I always, it. I always got to check. I just refuse to acknowledge it. I know. That's what I, I started enjoying that portion of the joke too. I was like, I love that he doesn't acknowledge it. I was yeah. like, oh, this is great. Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. Cool, man. All right. Let's hey, get the hell out of here. Yeah.